Teachers. Good evening and welcome to the May 19th Newark Unified School District Board of Education meeting. I call this meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. Uh, in regards to meeting practices, we are holding in-person board meetings at our district boardroom and are following the state's and Alameda County safety guidelines in public for public gatherings. Please refrain for atten from attending in-person meetings if you have COVID-related symptoms. If you are not able to attend the meeting in person, you may observe the meeting via the NUSD YouTube channel live stream transmission on Comcast channel 26, and we do have Spanish translation is available via Zoom. In regards to public comment, the public will have the opportunity to address the board regarding non-agendized matters and agendized items with a live audio only comment via Zoom with advance notice requested by email at public comment at newarkunified.org or a written comment by submitting a speaker card via email at public comment at newarkunified.org or with live in-person comments by submitting a speaker card with our executive assistant, Ms. Gutierrez. Roll call, please, Ms. Gutierrez. Member Zhang? Here. Member Marquez? Here. Member Hill? Here. Member Grindahl? Here. Uh, President Wood? Here. All present? Thank you. Um, before we move to approval of agenda, I believe there is an, um, an emergency um, amendment that we would like to make, uh, Superintendent Triplett. Yes, thank you, President Wynn, and good evening to board members. And um, well, there's no one here in the public, but uh, viewers what we're looking, watching at home and staff. So we do have um, one um, um, time-sensitive um, agenda item that we wanted to add. Um, this is, uh, Can you hear me? I realize it is uh, very irregular, um, but we do have a field trip that um, uh, would, was not able to make it onto the agenda that was posted on Monday, and so we wanted to bring it forth. It's a trip um, for Kennedy um, to go to Great America, and um, if the board saw fit to approve it, that the trip would be tomorrow. Okay. So at this time, um, how will we go about making the motion to add? You got a question from Member Hill? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't think Thank we you. can add that. Um, we have to give 72 hours notice. So this would be an urgent item. There are protocols, policies that do allow for urgent items to be uh, added to the agenda with board approval. And the motion would be uh, to approve the agenda with the addition of the field trip item. Okay. And then it would be added to um, consent and non-personnel items. So, so can it would we be cite? It would be added to, um, it would be item 15.11. Okay. So can we cite those protocols? Um, it is legal recommendation. I don't, I don't have um, a protocol or a policy in, in, in place right now, but um, that was recommended from legal. Okay, and then um, in order to put the emergency item on the agenda, what is the approval rate? I mean, we have to approve with... We do have a supermajority that is required to approve, so at this point it would need four out of the five members. Okay. All right, um, at this time... I'll move, a, <coughs> I'll, I'll move approval of the so, agenda. So, so the other wait, thing wait, is... Wait, wait, hold on a second. The... the, the, the the future will be paid by the parent donation rather than the district, right? That's correct. Yes, Member Hill? Yeah, so um, I'd also like us to pull one. I have a question about the agenda, and I'd like us to pull one item. I'd like us to pull 15.10, um, which are the minutes. Um, and it's because that's been mislabeled. It says minutes for 519, which is today. <clears throat> but if you look at the minutes, it's, it's from the last meeting. Um, so I'd like us to pull that and then bring it back to the, uh, in a subsequent meeting. Um, and then, but then connected to those minutes, <clears throat> as I looked at them, it reminded me that in our last board meeting, uh, we talked about the bond survey and we talked about how the survey was going to be brought back to the board in the next meeting. And I'm just curious um, why, why we don't have that on the agenda since that was committed to. So in regards to the um, minutes, if it is just a correction of the date, the correction, um, a 
an amendment could be requested to amend the, the or to make the correction and approve it as is if the board so wishes, or it could be removed and brought back to uh, a later meeting. Um, if I may, President, um, with regard to the, um, the bond, we will be uh, um, discussing it in the superintendent report. Okay. Thank you. So, so I guess if further question during a consent vote, you can pull that one item out for, for further discussion on the minutes. That's generally what we do. Like if there's issue with the minutes, you don't vote with the consent. You just pull that out and then do it individually and asking for change. Okay. So at this, it sounds like at this moment the motion is to approve the agenda with the added item of a 15.11 regarding the Kennedy field trip? That's what I was going to say. Okay, thank you. I'll second that. How do you... Yes. Member, <laughs> Member Zhang, how do you vote? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? No. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes. Four, four eyes and one no. Thank you. Okay, on to um, closed session items. Um, we will be discussing 3.2, public employee discipline dismissal release, 3.3, conference with labor negotiators, NTA and CSEA, 3.4, conference with labor negotiators, negotiators NUMA, and 3.5, conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation, 3.6, student expulsion. Thank you. We will recess to closed session.
Thank you and welcome, welcome back. Welcome everyone. Um, we are back from closed session and there is no, there isn't anything to report out from closed session. Okay, on to um, item 5.1, Pledge of Allegiance. Dr. Triplett. Oh, please rise. Is our, oh, okay. Please begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, before we move on to employee organizations, I have um, a clarification and statement that I would like to make in regards to whether or not we have adopted parliamentary rules and procedures. Um, CSBA clearly states that no particular set of rules is required for school or county boards. Ed Code 35010 states that the governing board of each school district shall prescribe and enforce rules not inconsistent with law or with the rules prescribed by the State Board of Education for its own government, meaning local boards are free to adopt a set of rules that works for them, which we as a board have our governance handbook. And thank you. Um, on to um, item 6.1. No, thank you. So, item 6.1. Yes, we do have um, NUMA uh, virtually. So, um, Ms. Vicente Ditto, you may begin. Good evening, President Wynn, Board of Trustees, and exec Executive Cabinet members. May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, a celebration of Asians and Pacific Islanders in the United States. AAPI encompasses all of the Asian continent and the Pacific Islands of Melanesia, Micronesia, and Polynesia. Many members of the Newark community identify as Asian America, I'm sorry, Asian American and Pacific Islander. Students get to see themselves reflected in the adults that support them from campus monitors, CSEA members, teachers, and leaders. Like a little girl who is first generation American, whose entire paternal side of her family came to the Tri-City area from the mountainous northern region of Luzon in the Philippines. Through the efforts of her family and the welcoming arms of the Tri-City area, her family was able to become established and thrived. That is when this adorable little girl with the roundest cheeks you would have wanted to squeeze came to be. Her first language was Tagalog and she didn't see many people at school that looked like her or sounded like her family. Still, she was supported and school was an amazing place for her. It was because she experienced the magic of public education that she became a lifelong learner who never wanted to leave school. She went on to graduate from high school, get her bachelor's degree in education, become a teacher, go back to school to seek her master's degree and ultimately became the principal and NUMA president addressing you tonight. <laughs> As leaders and managers, it is important to remember that our students deserve to have their heritage celebrated and recognized. As NUMA president making the last dress of the 22-23 school year, I want all of us to remember our NUSD resolution to reaffirm its commitment to foster a culture that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. That we are charged with ensuring that all AAPI students, staff, and community members feel safe, welcomed, and valued. From my personal experience, we are holding strong to this resolution. On behalf of NUMA, I'd like to thank all of the community members watching tonight or watching in the future for supporting students and educators this 21-22 school year. Thank you. Thank you. And there were no requests from NTA or CA, CSEA, but I don't know if there's any NTA present here. No one else. Thank you. 
Okay, on to item 7.1, public comment on non-agenda items. We do have one speaker. Ms. Uh, yes? We do have one virtual. Okay, um, let's go with the virtual one first. Okay. Thank you. Public comment is from Mr. Eric Tam. You may begin. Hello? Hi. Hi, uh, I'll just get straight to it. Um, thank you, uh, everybody. This is super short. Uh, I just wanted to um, give some shout outs. I wanted to thank you, uh, Mr. Cabuto, for a couple of meetings ago that he gave an update for HVAC. Um, you know, I appreciate you know, him trying to be more detailed and trying to provide more information. I want to say congratulations to Ms. Palavino. Uh, I think she's uh, being officially um, accepted as the full-time principal. Um, you know, thank you for her. And um, I want to say thank you to Ms. Uh, Gallagher. I think it was a couple of sessions ago that she also presented a metric-based um, kind of evaluation of baseline versus kind of progress, and I just really appreciate that work. Um, so in terms of um, just requests, uh, thank you to uh, Lucia. I think we were emailing earlier um, she's going to help me with some CPRA and also some um, open emails that I have emailed the uh, board and also uh, Dr. Triplett. So hopefully that can get resolved. Um, and then I think my final kind of little topic was related to Apex. So I'm, I'm going to like ignore the the, the personnel stuff. Um, I, I was just really curious to see, uh, ask Ms. Uh, Member Marquez if she was able to dig into the data that um, Ms. Pierce said that she would review with her. Um, I think you know, reviewing this, just trying to be objective. I was just curious about Ms. Pierce, why we didn't provide that data, if that was data was available in the system. You know, I think, you know, Member Marquez raised some really good points in terms of the metric about like, um, you know, exam repetition, how many were taken, kind of the duration of the course. You know, these are all kind of um, possible metric flags that you can uh, evaluate to, to understand if, you know, if the accusations are true or not. So. Just wanted to ask if that was uh, done or not, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tam. Um, Ms. Lisa Martinez, you have the floor. Welcome. Hello. Can I take this off to speak? I haven't been here in a while. Um, <laughs> good evening. Uh, hello, uh, Board President Nguyen, um, Board Superintendent Triplett, and the exec team. Um, thank you for everything that you do. Can't believe it's another year. Um, my name is Elisa Martinez, and I am a parent of two um, Newark Unified students, a high schooler and a junior higher. And I'm taking deep breaths because I've been thinking about how do I speak today without sounding angry, but I'm actually really ticked off. I'm angry. I'm angry because uh, I listened to the last meeting, and this is not the first time that I hear all these accusations that our students are cheaters. I can't believe I'm the only one that's ticked off by that. There is a process that is followed if there is suspicion that somebody is cheating. But the fact that we are permitting people to get up here and just throw those accusations, and worse yet, Board Member Hill, that you just sit here and amplify those accusations without following process. Do, we, do you even understand I listened to the meeting. There were so many points that you were out of line. Do you even understand what your role is? Have you gone to training? Because I have to believe that if you went to one session of training, you would understand that you were completely, completely out of line. I wonder, and, and I mean, I am here really to speak to Member Hill. So I understand that most of you are asking the right questions and want to get to the bottom of this. I'm not naive. Do some people, some kids cheat? Probably, right? But to go ahead and do this general accusation it is just completely unconscionable to me. Member Hill, I'm not sure why you ran for the seat. I'm not sure what you think the role of a board member is. But I encourage you to go to training because it's clearly not coming here every meeting after meeting and spewing out negativity instead of coming here to, pull, to help problem solve. Of any issue, this is something to come and problem solve. With your years of project management experience, come here and problem solve, not accuse baselessly. And as I watch the clock, I encourage the board to consider making uh, training for uh, governance, um, 
Masters in Governance to make it mandatory within the first year. I think that will do this board a huge service and most importantly to my kids because I don't understand why anybody so readily believes that that, that our kids are cheating, but I'm wondering if it's because my, the kids look like me, okay? So it makes me really doubt what's at the core of all these accusations. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Martinez. Okay, on to item 8.1, superintendent report, Dr. Triplett. Thank you, President Wen, and good evening again to the uh, board members and staff and um, community that are here this evening. As Ms. Gut uh, Ms. Gutierrez is putting up the deck. Great. So this is the um, this is the superintendent's report for this evening. Oh, there we go. Uh, number one, I, I did want to appreciate um, the the words of. Um, uh, Principal Ditto and NUMA President, and um, acknowledge Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month this month. Um, as you all will recall, the board passed a resolution last year, and um, and so this is um, I think important to just revisit and um, and both celebrate and acknowledge the importance of all of the contributions of our Asian American and Pacific Islander um, people in this country. Next slide, please. And um, th so I, I wasn't going to read out the whole resolution, but I did, um, did just want to read just the first part of what was passed last year by this board. The Newark Unified School District hereby remains resolved in the following. Number one, honoring May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month and denouncing hate crimes, hateful rhetoric, and hateful acts against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. And three, reaffirming its commitment to foster a culture that values diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it uh, goes on to speak about the month of May, set aside to honor the contributions of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, um, <clears throat> and the fact that uh, Congress in 1990 voted to expand um, Asian American heritage from a week to a month. And so, um, again, just wanna, just wanna call out the importance of us um, celebrating that all, all month. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, just to, to touch upon some some important things as they're um, as they're happening in the next couple weeks. Um, you, uh, I know uh, our teachers and students are well aware of the last day of school being June first, and um, so we're quickly approaching that. And everyone is working really hard to um, to wrap up the school year um, and to really acknowledge all of the hard work that's happened on the part of students and, um, and staff and, and, and teachers. Next slide, please. So I, I did touch upon this last time. The, the, we have our graduation and promotion ceremonies coming up. New York Memorial on the 2nd of June, Bridgepoint and Crossroads on the June 3rd, Newark High School, excuse me, Newark Junior High School on June 1st. And then if you go to the next slide, please, Ms. Gutierrez. And then we also have all of our promotion ceremonies for our elementary schools as well as our adult education. So we'll, we'll be posting this um, on the website and this is also being shared um, with all of the different school communities. So we're really excited to celebrate and um, the, the end of the year and all of our students' achievement. Um, wanted to touch upon a quick update around COVID-19. And we have um, uh, case rates from last week. So um, this is the second week in a row where we've seen a, um, a significant jump. So um, last uh, on May 2nd through the 8th, it was at 36. And this past week, it uh, continued to, to be higher than it has been um, prior, uh, prior to um, spring break. So we had 37 cases last week for students and eight cases for uh, staff. So. Because of this, we, um, we have made a decision not to um, adjust our parent volunteer um, policy and, and continue to stay with the, the current policy of not having parents um, on campus during regular school hours with um, just a few exceptions, and that is um, certain, um, certain end of year events. And so um, any, with schools hosting specific end of year events, we're having the schools submit 
a, a plan and making sure that it aligns with all of our COVID safety protocols. Next slide. So um, earlier, Member Hill, you, you uh, mentioned just a question about um, when we're going to um, revisit the, the school bond um, survey. So um, we did have the, uh, the survey was administered. Um, we received the, the um, preliminary results uh, uh, pretty recently, and so we wanted to make sure we had time to uh, analyze them uh, before bringing them to the board. So we will be bringing them uh, all the results to the board at the upcoming board meeting. Um, Ms. Dela Cruz, I, I think, uh, did you want to say anything else about the, the bond survey results? No. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll get into the details at the next board meeting. Yeah. And I believe we'll have our, our, um, our Consultant consultants here. come yes. to, uh, to go through each, each one and, um, and to really do a thorough analysis um, for, the, for the board. Next slide. Um, and I think this might be my last slide. So we did, um, we touched upon uh, Rocketry Club's fantastic achievements at the last board meeting. Um, they did, uh, they were able to go to Washington, uh, I guess technically Virginia, um, had a great trip, um, I think did really, really well. Um, but we did want to share one final, um, what we call a sizzle reel that was done by the MCA and in particular by um, one of the uh, MCA teachers, Mr. Um, Ingham, and, um, and I believe with, uh, with the help and support of uh, some students. So I thought we'd just roll this quick video. So again, just w wishing a big congratulations to the Rocketry Club for all of their achievements this year. And um, we also have coming up um, another aspect of the Star Academy that, um, that we're intending to fully roll out next year. But we do have a, um, a coding presentations that our um, uh, students who are in the computer science class will be doing, I believe it's next week, Ms. Gutierrez, does that sound right? The coding um, presentations by? I believe so, correct. Yeah. Um, and uh, would, would like to invite the board to uh, participate and, and, and come and see the incredible work of, uh, of our students in, um, in that class. And that is the presentation for tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Triplett. On to item 9.1, staff report, 9.1 summer school staff report. Dr. Triplett. Thank you. So um, I believe Ms. Um, Kierens and Ms. Pierce are going to come up, or just Ms. Pierce? Just Ms. Pierce. Um, both of them have done amazing work um, preparing for summer school. Um, we, uh, we wanted to share out and give you an update about where things stand. A um, lot, um, lot of work in a very short time to make sure that we have summer school up and running. And, um, we have a lot of interest on the part of our families and students in the summer school program this year. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Pierce. And Ms. Karens, if you want to join me, you are always welcome to do so. <laughs> um, so summer school is here. Um, it has been a long, challenging year. This, this, this year you'll notice that we actually moved it up a week um, after hearing some feedback from families. That way families have all of July for vacation as well as staff have all of July. Um, with their families as well. So um, we will see how this works out, get feedback from staff and make adjustments next year if we want to continue with this. Um, we're very excited. Um, we have more than um, we have space for in all honesty with our elementary program. We still have space in our, actually in our credit recovery program, but very limited. Um, and then we are also running an ESY program. Um, 
So the programs that you see here, elementary enrichment, um, which will be at Lincoln Elementary. We've got secondary credit recovery housed at Newark Memorial High School. And then we've got extended school year. That's for our special education students that will be here at Music. And again, feel free to jump in if you want to. Um, we do have um, some guest principals this year um, with uh, Mr. Rotherhammer um, joining us uh, for ESY and Ms. Uh, Ward Mikes, who was a principal here uh, in uh, Newark um, some years ago, who will be um, supporting our Newark Memorial High School. Um, and then we have Ms. Herrera in-house um, stepping up to be our elementary enrichment um, principal, who also happens to be in our, in our, in our audience today. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it will run from June 6th to July 1st. There will be no school um, in observance of Juneteenth holiday, um, federal holiday. Uh, we will run our extended school year from 8.30 to 12, um, as well as our secondary credit recovery. Um, elementary enrichment this year due to the ELOP um, grant that we've been discussing at length the last couple months um, will allow us to uh, extend the day for our TK, TK6 families from 12 to 5.30 with enrichment. Um, this will be with Think Together and CIWA, who will provide opportunities in VAPA, so visual and performing arts, um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and then physical activities in the afternoons. In addition to that, um, we will also be extending some of our SEAL lessons in the summer. As you know, it's been quite hard and challenging to find substitutes throughout the year. And so we are strategically putting some of our SEAL training into our summer school hours this year um, as a way of preventing pulling teachers out of the classroom during the regular school year um, and, and getting some um, targeted language lessons also in summer school. So it's sort of a win-win for, for everyone um, that we were able to do this. Um, summer school opportunities are open to all applicants. Um, like we said, um, registration is closed, but if you are interested, um, we are keeping a wait list. Um, as you know, things shift and change over the summer. So if you are interested, please reach out to the district office and we will make sure we get you on that wait list. Um, we are giving priority placement in TK-12 um, to youth with ELD low-income foster youth designations um, per the grant. Um, and then priority placement in high school credit recovery, obviously we always start with our seniors um, and our juniors who require credits to graduate. Um, admission has been confirmed via email, messages, and calls to families. Um, and again, um, admitted students will then complete the registration with emergency contact cards and et cetera to hold their spaces. Um, in addition to our summer school academic programs, we also have our lunch programs continued. Um, you can see here on our flyers in both English and Spanish that our nutritional services team will be working hard this summer to ensure that any families in need have access to um, food, nutritional cert, uh, nutrition, sorry, um, both breakfast and lunch. Um, we're also going to continue our family support, so our two parent partners will continue services for 35 hours a week um, th uh, through June. Um, so they will help with things like enrollment support, online registration throughout the summer. They will continue to do food dis distribution days from Schilling on June 1st and June 15th. Um, and then they're going to continue to do additionally, additional family outreach. We were able to receive a couple additional grants for um, our students um, uh, that are houseless. Um, and so we will be continuing to bring those funds in to provide things like PPE, eyeglasses, shoes, clothes, school supplies, and personal care items so that come August they are ready to go. So we're very excited about that grant and we're excited that our parent partners will continue to get the services to our, our families. And then we also have a fatherhood summit to any fathers that are interested. Um, this comes through Alameda County, but it's one of our, our partners that we discussed last time when we talked about parent engagement. I also just want to encourage um, all of our families to reach out to our principals, pay attention to those principal newsletters because we are also, these are some of the programs that we are offering in-house, but there are many programs offered throughout Newark. And so if you are interested in other opportunities, I, I highly encourage you to reach out to your site principal um, to get that information. And did I miss anything, Ms. Karen? All right. Thank you. I can answer any questions. Thank you. Rajan, do you have any comments or questions? Member Marquez? 
Good evening. Um, the one question I did have with regards to ELA, not necessarily ELD, but ELA, if there are any students that are looking for that bridge, especially from fifth into the sixth now, making that transition into middle school or an eighth grader who's looking for that bridge into high school, are we offering anything with regards to ELA to, to, with the bridge? Um, I do know that we were really looking and trying to set up some just bridge programs in general for our transitioning grades, middle school in particular. Um, at this point, it, it is looking just, just from what we're seeing around staffing for summer school that we may not be able to offer that this year. Um, that doesn't mean that we won't be able to offer it in future years, um, but we are, again, we're kind of beholden to what kinds of staff we can bring in um, and uh, what programs we can offer. So when you talk about ELA specifically with transition. Right, so from elementary into the middle school or from the junior high to the high school. So yeah. you know, for, in the, you know, math as well, right? But if we offered some type of bridge just to help with keeping you know, the information or keeping what, what they've learned fresh, um, yeah. to be able to offer that to students. So right now, oh, go ahead. Um, we we uh, are planning on uh, providing a, a, like an orientation bridge. Um, program uh, a week or less um, closer to the start of school for okay. our um, rising sixth graders. Okay. Um, but uh, it, it wouldn't be a part of the whole summer school, you know, four weeks, uh, but more specifically targeted for, uh, for our sixth graders entering the, um, the middle school. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Member Hill? Member Grindel? Oh, thank you for the, the excellent report. Um, it's, uh, it's really great news. I'm just very happy to see that the, the food programs are continuing um, and they're associated. Um, and um, I'm assuming that we'll be um, utilizing that program to sign up more people for the free and reduced lunch programs. Because um, um, th these, these lunches are free for all at this point, right? Or, or, or is there a cost? So uh, again, that that's caused us some problems because there's the incentive um, to f sign up for the program hasn't been there. So we've, uh, I, th I think, I think because of that, we've kind of seen a fall off on that. So um, I'm hoping and expecting that that'll be that'll be done. Um, beyond that, just uh, I think it's exciting and appreciate um, all the work that's being done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, moving on to item. 9.2, letter from Alameda County Office of Education regarding the 2021-22 second interim budget report. Dr. Triplett. Thank you. I'll turn this one over to Ms. Dela Cruz. Thank you, Dr. Triplett. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, this letter was uh, shared with the board, and um, it's a review from the Alameda County Office of Education. The board approved a positive certification of the second interim report on March 3rd, and soon after that, we submitted our report to the county. And after the county reviewed it and analyzed it, they concur with the board's approval of a positive certification. Um, they did acknowledge and mention the multi-year projections and the um, four and a half million and 4.7 million deficit that's projected in the next two out years and commends the board for passing a resolution to commit to um, implementing expenditure reductions to balance the budget. They also mentioned the audit finding and acknowledge that it may impact our uh, financial um, condition based on um, the potential uh, 600000 that we may end up having to pay to the state. But um, as you know, we talked about um, filing an appeal, and that's still our plan. And we're hoping um, that that will be a positive outcome. But um, other than that, the, the letter um, does present a, a positive, and they concur with with the board. Any questions? Any questions from the board? Um, Member Zhang? Can you talk about the May revise and ask related to any ch change on that? <laughs> <laughs> I could give you a, a little bit of information, um, just a couple of highlights. Uh, the school services workshop is being presented tomorrow, and I also have my um, 
Northern California CBO meeting tomorrow as well. So we'll get a little bit more detail on, on the uh, May revise, but it does include 6.56% uh, COLA. Um, it was 5.33 uh, originally. And there's also uh, another provision to help us mitigate our declining ADA, where um, they, they're allowing us to use our historical attendance, um, ADA to enrollment attendance ratio pre-COVID to calculate our 21-22 ADA, and then to use that as part of the three-year rolling average. So that's really good. And... Um, $8 billion in one-time discretionary funds, um, and that's going to be allocated on a per ADA basis, one-time money. So just a few highlights. Thank you. Um, Member Hill? Thank oh, you, Ms. I, I'm sorry. I skipped over Member Marquez. Member Marquez, do you have any <clears throat> comments? I do. Thank you. Um, with the $8 billion, do we know if that's going to be specific as to where it will need to be allocated, or will that be at the discretion of the, the school board directly? It's uh, discretion of the school board. It's very flexible in terms of um, allowable uses. Thank you for that. And my second question is, with regards to the deadline, was the deadline specified as to when that potential appeal that we want to place for the 600000 when that deadline is? So the clock um, starts when we receive our letter from the controller on our audit report. We haven't yet received that letter. So once we receive that letter, we have 60 days to file an appeal. From the state controller, is that correct? From the state controller, is that correct? Yes, the, there's a letter that comes from the state controller. Um, we submit our audit report to the state, and then they review it, and they send us a letter saying, you know, that they certify our audit report, and we're still waiting for that report. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Um, Member Hill? Yeah, thank, thank you, Ms. De La Cruz. Um, <clears throat> yes, so the, the letter that is coming from um, the ACOE, the Alameda County Office of Education, it is confirming that, um, that we're getting a, a positive certification. Um, mm -hmm. but, but what it's also saying, and again, I think that we need to keep this in, in the forefront of our minds as we go forward, is it says, while the district projects a budget surplus of 415,667 to the unreject, uh, unrestricted general fund in 2021-22, it projects deficits of 4.5 million in 2022-23 and 4.7 million in 2023-24. The second interim budget report projects the structural deficit remains and the district could again require budget balancing solutions in the near future. Um, and then it goes on to, to end that paragraph saying, because of the compounding effect of reductions on MY, MYP, NUSD's proactive efforts to mitigate deficit spending will um, minimize the needed reductions re required um, to the out year. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the, and then as Member Marquez was indicating, um, you know, we have an added issue, which is the, um, the 657,000 in, you know, potential clawback. Um, so I guess, you know, number one, I think that we, we really need to keep in mind that we have a structural deficit and we really need to be watching every penny um, and not, um, not engaging in unnecessary expenditures. But, um, but question for you, Ms. De La Cruz, let's, let's say that, we, that the appeal is not successful. What are our plans on addressing this 657000 in basically unplanned um, costs? It would either um, come out of our reserves or a carryover. Okay, thank you. Madam President, if I yes. may, um, I just want to interject and, and let the audience know if you haven't had the opportunity to read this, that there was a crucial there was a crucial line that was left out in the sharing of the document that came from ACUE, and it actually states that ACUE commends our board for its approval of the resolution 2021.22. Um, Point twenty nine committing the district to implementing expenditure reductions. Um, it says, excuse me, a reductions of up to four point five million for twenty two twenty three and up to four point seven million for twenty three twenty four. 
So when I read this, what I'm, what I'm understanding is that ACOE is coming in because we are aware of what's going on and that we are preparing ourselves to take care of whatever is coming our way, currently in a conservative manner, right? That's when we went through our budget, we were maintaining that conservatorship, knowing that in the event we were not to receive the funds, this is what we would be up again. Am That's, I correct? That, is, that is correct. And in fact, remember we had a study session where we addressed the um, deficits and offered uh, potential balancing solutions. That's correct. Thank you for the acknowledgement. Yes, Member Hill? Yeah, and so, um, so yes, I, um, uh, I agree that, that um, the ACOE um, is commending us for the, for the resolutions that we've taken. But the thing that I think that shouldn't be lost on everybody is that both in the first interim as well as in the second interim, they are emphasizing the fact that um, although we are you know, above water at this point, we are in, in danger. And, I, and the part that I really want to emphasize with the board is resolutions are words, right? What we need to focus on is actions, and we need to make sure that we actually take the actions that result in, in chipping away and hopefully overcoming these deficits. So the resolution's a good start, but I think that they're expecting, and that's why they're warning us, to say, you know, you now need to, you need to follow through on what you've committed. Member Grindel? <clears throat> Member Marcus took all of my questions, so I'm going <laughs> to be done with that. Same. Thank you, Ms. Doug. Yeah, just one oh. final comment. That, yeah, I think... Ever since I got on the board, I think we have a pretty decent track record when it comes to cost reduction. So ever since I got on the board, we have already have three years of consecutive budget surplus. So I think we'll be okay. Thank you, Member Zhang. And I do want to echo that we, as a board, uh, in the past few years, we have been really diligent about um, making sure that we respect the financials of the district and have made significant um, I guess you could say reductions and sacrifices in that sense too, um, to be able to balance the budget. And then not only that, um, the multi-year projections uh, that were made, that were submitted for the second interim um, was made very conservatively without any additional information in regards to the May revise. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you. On to um, item 10.1, termination of student ex expulsion, case number E2122-08. The recommendation is to terminate the expulsion for the expulsion case. Make it a motion to approve. I move that we approve the termination of expulsion. I second. Motion made by Member Zhang, seconded by Member Marquez. Member Zhang, how do you vote? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes, uh, five eyes. On to item 10.1, um, the recommendation, it's readmission of student expulsion, uh, case number E2122-016. The recommendation is to terminate and readmit the student into an USD as it relates to the expulsion case. Make it a motion to approve. I'll move to approve 10.2. Motion made by Member Grindel. Seconded. Seconded by Member Marquez. How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes. Five ayes on item 10.2. Um, 10.3, readmission of student expulsion, case number E2122-07. The recommendation is to terminate and readmit the student into NUSD as it relates to the case. May I get a motion to approve? President Wynn? Yes. Um, sorry, it, are we on 10.3? Yes, we're on 10.3. Uh, in this case, it's uh, the recommendation is to readmit the student. No termination right there. Yes. Yeah. I move to readmit the student. We had to. We had a clarification. Okay. Yes. I move to readmit the student. Okay. Motion made by Member Zhang. I second. Seconded by Member Marquez. How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez. Yes. Member Grind uh, Member Hill. Yes. Member Grindel. Yes. I'm also a yes. Uh, five eyes on ten point three, and the last one, um, item ten point four, in student expulsion is the 
extension of suspended enforcement of student expulsion, case number E2122-14. The recommendation is to extend the suspended enforcement of expulsion an additional academic semester for the expulsion. Make it a motion to approve. I move that we approve. I second. Motion made by Member Marquez, seconded by Member Zhang. Member Zhang, how do you vote? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also yes, five eyes on item 10.4. Thank you. On to um, public hearing, item 11.1, Sunshine Proposal Reopener for Newark Teachers Association NTA contract. Um, public hearing is now open. Are there any, there's no comments. Public hearing is now closed. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry. I apologize. Mem um, Ms. Villa, please come on up. Thank you. I'm sorry. I was late. The junior, New York Junior High 7th grade girls basketball had a championship game. Oh, today. awesome. And my daughter's on that team, so it was a good game, and the traffic was tough getting back here. Did they win? You no, know, they Aww. lost. It was close. It was 10 to 9. Oh, okay. I know, so it was really close. And traffic trying to get here. I apologize. No um, worries. But thank you for letting me. And I didn't turn in a paper. I apologize. Um, okay, so let me get started here. Yes, yes. All right. Um, well, good evening, Mr. Triplett, board members. Um, my name is Sherry Villa, and I'm the head negotiator for our NTA negotiations team for the upcoming negotiations. Um, our NTA negotiations team, we have three elementary teachers and three secondary teachers representing general education, special education, and alternative education classrooms. Um, work has already begun on our side, as I'm sure it is on your side as well. Um, to have meaningful and productive negotiations. We are NTA members and NUSD, we're all coming from a place of understanding that students come first. So I'm confident that together we're going to begin to heal relationships and build a new path on a different direction to, to make Newark a destination place like, like we, we all want it to be. That's all I got. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Villa. With that, public hearing is now closed. Okay, on to old business, item 12.1, elementary report card, Dr. Triplett. Thank you, President Wynn. So uh, as you recall, um, we have uh, come to the board with uh, updates on the elementary report card uh, progress throughout the year. And uh, so we are now bringing this, uh, this item back. We have some um, fantastic elementary report card committee members here in the audience, teachers. And um, I believe Ms. Pierce is going to lead this. And then um, also we're going to hear from uh, some of the members of the committee. We, we also do have Mr. Dolowich, who's led this process um, on Zoom, but he was unable to attend in person today. All right, um, so forgive me, yes. Um, we do have him on call in case we do have any questions, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and get us started. So as you know, we had a, uh, the board requested um, that we go back and we look at um, elementary report cards um, over the course of this year. Um, so the presentation outcomes are to provide the background and history of elementary report card in Newark over the past few years, to communicate the goals and work of the elementary report card committee for the 21-22 school year, and to formally receive board approval for the updated grade level report cards for grades TK5 in NUSD. Um, first, uh, we want to acknowledge the elementary report card committee members um, that you see here. Um, they worked this year um, and, and, and really gave us, I think this was a board request to really make sure that we involve our teachers um, in this process and they, they were in effect our experts um, throughout the year um, on their committee. And we have two of them uh, with us today who will talk a little bit more um, about the process later in this presentation. Um, so again, the, a little background and history. Um, following the Common Core uh, state standards, NUSD K-6 teachers expressed interest in improving alignment with those standards and the report cards. Um, so the main goal was to up upgrade report cards to reflect alignment with those Common Core state standards um, and really continue kind of the conversation and the movement towards more standards-based grading. 
Um, so a report card committee was formed in 2018-19 school year. Um, site representatives made contributions to the report card for the 1920 school year. And then on February 21st, 2019, the report card committee voted for grades K-5 to change from a one to four rubric to a one to three rubric, three being met, two approaching, and one not met. Um, the report card changes remained internal as part of a pilot, and the report card changed to a one to three scale for the 1920 school year. Um, uh, at that point, there were questions brought, I want to say, um, towards the end of last year around the three scale and wanted more information around whether we would stick with the three-point scale or go back to a 1.4. And so that became some of the work of the committee this year. So a little overview. Um, the Curriculum and Assessment Council sort of overviewed projects. Um, and the report card committee met six times. 81% also part of this was getting more staff feedback besides just the committee. Um, out of that survey, 81% of our TK5 teaching staff did complete that survey, which we will show um, a little bit of the results later on. And the report card committee conducted working meetings um, and then recommended updated drafts. Um, and the curriculum council reviewed and approved on April 28th, 2022. Um, just a little bit more detail again on exact dates with the overview. Um, when um, the survey was sent out, um, when the committee returned using the data from the survey to discuss next steps and specifically discuss um, the one to three or the one to four. Um, they then continued to meet to make updates um, and then uh, basically draft and then approve those drafts. There was also um, on May 10th, 2022, there was also a report card community engagement as well with families. And if Mr. Dollage was here, I'm sure he could tell you more about that. Um, Dr. Triplett, do you have anything to add before I move on? Okay. Um, the goals for the committee throughout this year were to do three main um, items. To update grade level language as necessary. To determine if we should bring back the four-point scale for, all, for any grades, all grades, or just the upper grades, 3-5. And to formally receive board approval, again, regarding a final TK-5 elementary report card in spring. Um, so that we could finally move forward with a more permanent report card. Um, there were working groups. Again, the committee met six times this year. Um, so one of the working group's um, goals were to correct errors on grade level report cards. So really reviewing the staff feedback for some errors that they may have noted and then recommend changes for any grade level mistakes. So if um, a particular standard had shifted between grade levels, making sure that again, it really aligned with the Common Core State Standards. Two, to identify themes and patterns, patterns of grade level feedback. So identify and incorporate suggestions for improvement. And then again, improve grade level standards alignment. And three, to improve grade level language um, regarding the standards. So coordinate with principals to share um, at staff meetings and then elicit colleague input to improve that grade level specific language. Um, to talk a little bit more about this, we have Brandy Wex and Lena Yep. Um, grade one and grade two, so I'm going to invite them up at this time, um, and they're going to tell a little bit more details um, about the process, and I'm hoping, again, Mr. Dollich was here today, so hopefully I didn't take too much of what you were going to say. Okay, great. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Brandi Wex. I teach first grade at Coyote Hills Elementary. Um, I am happy to say that I was a part of writing the original Newark Unified Elementary Common Core report cards about 10 years ago when we met from the try copy, write your pencil through um, carbon copy report cards that we did when I first started teaching. Um, and we, I said, you know, guys, we really should have something digital. Um, and luckily, new standards came in right about that time. So I was a part of that committee um, with some of my colleagues now. And so coming into this... Um, it was great to get to start to look at how do we continue to take what we've learned over the last decade of being teachers in Common Core and how do we make a report card that even further reflects the teaching that we're doing, the learning that students are doing, and how we know now to communicate that with parents. Um, and something that I feel strongly about is that our report cards are not only a reporting document to parents, but they're also a reporting document between professionals. As our students move between districts in the state and out of state, we want to make sure that this document is something that other professionals understand what a student is learning, what a student may need more work on, and as well as making sure parents know what their students need work on. 
um, we are, sorry, just let me check. Um, so we, uh, one of the things that we wanted to make sure is that we take this document now and we continue work with it. It's not finished. Um, it is not a single piece of paper. It's not six individual documents. It's a, a com the elementary report card is something that is con it goes across all of our grades and it is an uh, it encapsulates a student's learning from kindergarten through fifth grade. So it's an entire document that is made of several different parts and we want to make sure that there's alignment from kindergarten and even through TK all the way up through fifth grade. So there are strands of standards that you can follow across the grade levels and watch a student's progression um, and see where their learning has got, has strengthened or maybe where they need focus as you go back through a student's um, report cards. Um, as we continue, uh, we really noticed that the next thing that we need to do is start building rubrics so that all of our teachers have the same tools that we're scoring students with and it really will bring some validity to what we're scoring. And how, when we say a student has this score, we know that across all of our, for instance, first grade classrooms, that that score means the same thing. Those students were taught the same thing, they were assessed in the same way, and that score means the same thing across all of the schools. So that's a really big job to take on. Um, and Lena's gonna talk a little bit more about how um, we approached some of the things that we changed as well this year. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lena Yep, and I'm a second grade teacher at Birch Grove Primary School. So, been a part of this committee for a few years. And this year, our goal was to really kind of finish out the job that we started, I think, of this particular section of the committee about three years ago, or three school years ago. And so this year, we really tried to figure out, okay, what are our goals? And as we went through, our goals just to figure out what we need to fix on this report card and make it a document that we could finally carry through with as we switched over into standards-based grading. And in November, December, right around the time of the first trimester, when teachers had been working with report cards, we asked for teacher feedback. We heard back from about 80% of our teachers regarding what that they liked about the report card, changes they wanted to see, and um, just per grade level, what it was that teachers were interested in um, seeing. So once we take, took a look at that, we found that there were some different focuses in terms of what K to two teachers were looking at and what three through five teachers were looking at. So within our committee, we broke up into grade level groups. We kind of took a look at those and crystallized what each grade level was asking for. And then we took that information back to our school sites, checked back with teachers to see if it kind of aligned with what they thought and were able to just gather new feedback. So based on these ideas, how do you feel about these changes that we're looking at? Once we had our grade level information, we were able to take that and within our committee, as Brandy said, the previous committee spent a lot of time trying to make sure that there was vertical alignment from K through five. So we saw similar standards all the way through. So now that we knew what grade levels were interested in um, seeing, we went through and made sure that we tried to align the language across all six grade levels so that and you're mostly seeing the same type of language from kindergarten all the way up through grade five. You know, TK standards and language is a little bit different. Um, they're a more specialized program. So our committee did focus on the K through five aspect. And what we found was in third grade through fifth grade, students have the skills that at that point, they're really reading to learn. They're applying the skills that they have gained over the years. However, in kindergarten through second grade, many of the teachers were working on concrete skills. So skills such as identifying letters, knowing your letter sounds, can you read sight words? Can you read one, two, and three digit numbers? Do you know your math facts? Those are very much concrete skills. And they're skills that you either know or you don't know. There's not really a lot of room to see this deeper understanding. And you can really see that in terms of when you take a look at the report card drafts in the reading foundational skills, you'll see seven lines in on the K report card, whereas there's only one line on the third through fifth grade report card, because our goal is to build these skills into our students. And once they have all of these skills, 
they're able to hit third grade running and really ready to apply their knowledge to learn new things and to grow from there. So that's one of the reasons why, in terms of talking about the question of the four, it was really a very different feeling from the K2 teachers versus the 3-5 teachers. And some of the reasons for our eventual recommendation were that we felt like for teachers that were in the K2 range, the four could be misleading to parents, especially the way that it's been done to this point in our district. Instead of tying it to a rubric-based grade, which is what standards-based grading is meant to be, it was been tied to percentages. And so in terms of if you know your letter sounds, well, we have 26 letters, you should know all 26. If you know 26, you're meeting the standard. There's not really a way to exceed the standard because it's concrete. However, parents, especially of younger students, when seeing a four, would feel that their students might be doing advanced level work or they maybe they're ready to go to the next grade level because they have a four. The other thing was we were seeing the four did not necessarily carry through all the way because a student who knew all their legend sounds, they might have more difficulty as the set of skills got a little more, more challenging once they hit first grade and second grade. So it was causing some distress or um, frustration among parents and students of how their student was scoring a four and suddenly they're getting a three and or possibly even a two. So the students were not falling behind. It was just showing how they were meeting standards as they moved on to different and more concrete skill sets. So hopefully that's, as Mahendi said, that's something that we hope to address once we switch over to standards-based grading and help teachers, parents, and the community understand what standards-based grading looks like versus a percentage report per grading. Thank you. Thank you both for sharing. Uh, obviously, it comes back so much clearer when you, when you have a teacher come explain it. So please stick around in case there are any questions at the end. Um, just to elaborate a little bit on what they both said, um, again, 80% of our TK5 uh, teachers did take this. And you, as you can see, when it's just a straight question, should a four be brought back, it, it almost appears split. But what you see here by the yellow is we should just stick with a one to three all the way through grades TK5. The light green is, okay, we can bring back a four, but really for our upper grades, three, five, at that split that was just mentioned, right? At the, the TK to second grade, you're really learning to read. Starting in third grade, you're, you're, you're reading to learn. And it's a quite a bit of a shift there for our students. Um, and then um, versus uh, teachers who thought all grades TK five. I think what's interesting about what our teachers just said, though, is they really went and unpacked the feedback that was given as well and saw sort of a shift between our 3-5 teachers versus our key TK2. And I think that's the powerful part about surveys. We can show the chart, but they really dived into the feedback that was provided by our teachers um, to, give, to give their recommendations today. So again, the rationale for maintaining a three in the lower grades and at the risk of, of reiterating here, um, this was a unanimous decision. So this really is about teacher advocacy here around the elementary report card. Um, there was some confusing points for parents. I think we talked a little bit about that. You know, if, if the skill for maybe kindergarten is to um, know all of your letters, you know, what is a four then? Is a four knowing all of your letters and some of your phonics? Is a four knowing your letters in English and Spanish? Is a four knowing, you know, it, it, it becomes less clear when you start going beyond a very concrete skill, foundational skill. Um, and we wanted to make sure it was very clear um, for, for, for our entire community. And then really it is developmentally more appropriate um, to consider that one to three specifically at the lower grades when they're learning how to read. For the upper grades, um, it's actually in alignment with, with some of our, um, our, our neighboring school districts as well. Um, I believe um, both Fremont and Pleasanton also at the upper grades kind of make that shift as a transition into getting to the older grades and then transitioning through middle school. Um, so it's not uncommon to kind of make that shift happen around that third or fourth grade year. Um, it also feels more developmentally appropriate as they're reading to learn. Um, and then again, the majority of the upper grade teaching staff, again, that full survey with all of our teachers don't, don't show this, but the majority of our upper grade teaching staff are the ones that started advocating for that, um, bringing in that four. Um, so some considerations 
Um, we, they also updated our TK report card. Um, PE teachers, there were no changes made. Um, our science resource teachers um, also made updates to align with standards. Um, the committee itself unanimously recommended bringing back one to four for grades three, five only. I think that unanimous, unanimous vote is, is quite a strong um, statement of advocacy. Um, they also want to shift four from exceeding to strongly met. Again, they're looking within those grade level standards, and so exceeding implies, could imply very different things. Strongly met is sticking within that grade level standard that they're assessing in that moment. So rather than um, conjecturing about what exceeding could mean, let's, let's stick within our grade level standards and, and get really focused around our instruction there. And then Ed Services held community engagements um, where parents also reiterated some of these feelings and statements that you're hearing tonight. Um, here is the pilot report card front. And again, these are in, um, these were in the notes, so I'm not gonna take too much. Um, the pilot report card back and then our official recommendation to the board tonight. It is the recommendation of NUSD Elementary Report Card Committee and Curriculum and Assessment Council that the NUSD Board of Trustees formally approve the updated grade level report card for grades TK5 as presented. And uh, we have teachers, we also have Mr. Dolowich on the line and myself if there are any questions. Thank you, Ms. Pierce. Member Zhang, do you have any questions or comments? Uh, no questions. Uh Based on the survey result that uh, more than half of the teacher, I guess, initially wanted to bring this back to all grades. So I will, my top, top choice will be bringing this one to four scale back to all grades. Member Marquez. Thank you. Um, first of all, I wanted to um, congratulate the staff in, with all the work that they put in and the time. Um, I wanted to recognize the fact that on grade, grade five's report card, offering that information when it comes to LPAC and letting the families know and see they can actually see and lay one report card next to the other and see the progression of their, their child versus waiting for a report that comes in the summer when the school year is over, I think is very impactful. Um, and, also, and also reviewing, I noticed that some of the actual um, categories, if you will, when we're testing for LPAC is reflected in our actual report card overall right, the reading, the listening. So it's just not unique to, to the EL, ELL students, but overall it's something that's being addressed, which I've always asked when I gave CELT previously, what type of um, assessment we could give that would be just as effective as the LPAC to EO students as well, just to see our full picture. So it, it's um, very pleasant and rewarding to see that it's overlapping already in this report card um, with the English language arts. So thank you for that and for all your hard work. Thank you, Member Marquez. Member Hill. Yeah. So th thank you for the presentation and thank you both for coming and, and explaining more. And I and I understand um, the logic that you're laying out. Um, at the same time, I'm I, I share with Member Zhang a little bit of of you know nervousness or worry about um, moving to a uh, a less or or, f or fewer categories. Um, but I understand the, um, y your logic. Um, but I, I would personally like to see, because it sounds like we did, we, we surveyed the teachers, maybe there's some gradation there, but, um, but did, it, I don't, it doesn't sound like we, we surveyed the parents. Um, and it would be nice to maybe hear the parents' viewpoint on this before we as a board make a decision. And so I'm, I'm recommending that maybe we do that and then bring this back for a final vote. Member Grindel. Well, first of all, I want to thank the committee um, uh, and particularly um, Ms. Weeks and Ms. Yep for coming and explaining tonight. Um, you certainly uh, made uh, the logic of the, um, of, the, of the proposed change very clear. And um, I'm, I, I believe that we need to rely upon the um, trained professionals that are familiar with our students and familiar with the standards. Um, having the unanimous uh, approval of the of the committee and um, and the the logic that you presented, I, I'm in strong support of the staff recommendation to um, 
to do this. It's very important, and the, we, and the board made this clear, starting this process and in others, we want to hear and have the teachers involved. The teachers are the ones who are interacting on a day-to-day -day basis. They're, they're the ones who are, are teaching our children, and we have to really listen to them about um, what's the best way to go. And in, in this case, it's very clear that our professionals are telling us to go this way, and that's, that, that's the way I'm going to be voting. Thank you, Member Grindel. So lastly, and as a parent, um, initially, I was really thinking that, yes, uh, it would make sense to have one through four across the board so that we go through the whole process, understanding at each grade level. But after listening to Ms. Yep and her stating the fact that, you know, percentages really did um, confuse parents, and I was one of those confused parents um, at, at the lower grade levels. So um, that definitely changed my pers perspective um, coming into the meeting versus after hearing your explanation. So um, from that perspective, and then also looking at all the report cards from kindergarten through second grade and then third through fifth, you guys did definitely put a lot of thought into it and effort into what is what is needed to be captured and how um, how it is being relayed back to the parents and how the students will be able to improve moving forward. So with that said, yes, please. <laughs> Um, I just want to add, um, on the committee, there's a high proportion of the teachers there that are K to K to second teachers. So I think that the coming from that committee that it was a unanimous, unanimous vote really represented those grade levels, but I'm not going to speak for all the schools and all the teachers in saying that the representatives that were chosen as um, to be on that committee, not everybody is going to love every decision, so I'm sure that there's some of that there. But I also wanted to add that we have a lot of tools to communicate to students and to parents and to other teachers that our students are performing uh, below, at, or far above grade level. So we have a lot of measured assessments that we use and communication tools and rubrics. For instance, our DRA, I'm, score, I'm working with students right now in my, as I'm assessing students for the end of the year for their reading. I'm assessing students in kindergarten levels as well as second grade levels as a first grade teacher. And I'm able to communicate that with parents, that your student, yes, they're getting a three on our report card, but their ability is far beyond what maybe we expected this student to be able to do. And I have tools to communicate that with them. What does that look like? What does the reading come material that's appropriate for that student look like and how can that continue and that goes directly to their next teacher to continue them they're not starting back at where all first graders you know where all second graders will start at the beginning of the year in addition we have rubrics that come with the writing program the Lucy Hawkins writing program so um, schools that are using that closely are able to score students um, for as a first grade teacher I'm able to score student at first grade as their on grade level at kindergarten level below grade level or at a preschool level in addition to a second grade level and not in different items. So I'm able to communicate that a student has those skills to their parent, to that child, and also um, to their next teacher. So I just wanted to add that the report card is only one tool that we have, and it's a really small way of communicating. Most teachers will put the most important part of that report card is what you don't see there, which is the comments. So I think reinforcing that we have a lot of ways that we can communicate that doesn't have to be a grade for a six-year-old. Um, Correct. I think that's it. Any other comment? I'm happy to answer any more questions if you have them on that. No, thank you so much. Thanks. But uh, and I am in agreement that yes, third through fifth grade definitely should be at one through four. And I think because at that point, I mean, with m my own children, um, you know, I wanted them when they got the three and the the way that it was weighted um, at that time, you know, knowing where she had fallen and stuff like that. Um, I think it gave way to her feeling really confident that she did really well, but knowing what the material was, she really didn't, you know, understand and fully grasp the material, even though she earned the three. Um, so I think that, yeah, definitely from, you know, grades three to five, that makes a huge difference. Thank you. Okay, with that said, would you like to make the motion, yes, Member Yes, ma'am. Madam President, I move that the board approve the updated drafts of the elementary report card for grades TK through fifth as presented this evening. I'll second that motion. Motion made by Member Marquez, seconded by Member Grindel. How do you vote, Member Zhang? 
So not my top choice, but still better than the current status. So I will vote yes. <laughs> Member Marquez. Yes. Member Hill. Yes. Member Grindel. Yes. Also yes for me. Five eyes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Yep and Ms. Wex. Thank you. Okay, on to item 12.2, ELD Curriculum Adoption Amendment. Dr. Triplett. Thank you, President Wynn. So um, as you will recall, the board approved the ELD curriculum last year, um, and um, the, the teachers have been, been implementing that curriculum. However, there was uh, certain um, parts of the curriculum, certain levels, that, um, that was not originally adopted, and so this is being brought back as an amendment to get approval from the board to adopt these uh, additional ELD curriculum levels. And I believe uh, Ms. Kearns is here to speak on this or um, add any other information. Pretty brief, but nice to see you all this evening. Um, yeah, um, we did a great adoption process. Um, however, I think the gist is we didn't adopt the series formally. So I wanted to bring that back to the board and we did do um, some work with um, with our students and teachers to make sure this was still the right stuff. So um, this is what was adopted in May 2021 for the junior high. Beginners got I read, uh, Get Ready um, and intermediates got Pathways Level 3. In the high school, beginners also got Get Ready and for intermediates and advanced, we got Edge Fundamentals. So I think the thing we need to point out here is when this adoption was made, I think um, maybe the intention was to adopt the series, but what was on the documents was these do these individual textbooks, which are just a portion of the series. So for Pathways Level 3, there's also Pathways Level 4. And for Edge Fundamentals, there's also Edge A, B, and C. So uh, I'm just going to share a little bit. So our suggested revision is to adopt the full sequence of the Edge curriculum in order to support all levels of ELD courses and to adopt Pathways 4 to support the addition of the advanced ELD classes at the junior high. <coughs> So what it will look like in total, a little more comprehensive view, beginning ELD will continue to be get ready at the junior high, intermediate ELD will be pathways three, advanced ELD would be pathways four, beginning ELD again, get ready and edge fundamentals. So what was formally adopted was also a sort of beginning level. Then the early intermediates would get edge A, intermediates edge B and advanced edge C. <clears throat> So we did do a pilot process on those additional textbooks. Um, in October, um, we, I met with uh, the teachers to discuss their concerns regarding what was adopted from the previous year. That's sort of what came to my attention. In November, we received pilot materials um, for Edge A through C for the teacher to review a pilot. Um, the teacher prepared to pilot materials in semester two. Um, they piloted it with students in January, February, then March collected data for the students um, and their survey responses were also collected. And in April, um, the presentation and approval of the amendment, um, or the, yeah, the modification basically to the, to the curriculum council and it was approved. Um, I think that is pretty much the gist of it. I think that's, I have additional data regarding the student surveys, but they were all very positive, nothing um, particularly to note there. So this is, in a sense, a continuation of what was adopted and merely a correction of what I think was intended to be adopted last year. Thank you, Ms. Kearns. Are there any questions um, or comments from the board? Are we ready to make a motion? Member so, Zhang? So, so I asked this question before the board meeting regarding the lottery funding source. Can, can we talk about what kind of uh, items the lottery fund can, can be paying for? The lottery is mostly for instructional materials and any instructional related type um, uh, salaries and benefits. Thank you, Ms. Stella Cruz. Any other comments or questions, Member Jean? Member Marquez? And then at this time, I'm ready to make a motion. Thank you. Um, Member Hill? Yeah, so thank you, Ms. Cairns. Um, and I suspect you probably know <laughs> what I'm going to say. Yes. <laughs> um, but um, so, so as, a, as a teacher, I've had exposure to C-Engage. 
Um, and they're this, you know, educational behemoth, you know, that creates all these materials. And, um, and to be frank, the materials that I've been exposed to <laughs> have been pretty poor. Um, now, I, I can grant that, you know, and I can acknowledge that there could be, you know, again, different areas where it's stronger or weaker. I don't have personal knowledge of this. But my, my question to you is, is that the district has a, has a history going back decades of adopting new programs, new curriculum, and, and then with no real clear goals and no way to measure success. And then at some point, nothing re really works out, and then it just quietly kind of dies, and, and we move on to something else. So if, if we're going to adopt this, what, what are our goals? What are we hoping to see? And why, why do we need to be adding this to achieve those goals? I think the fundamental one here would be to make sure we're in compliance with um, having a, the appropriate curriculum for the provided course level. So, uh, for example, if we are adding an ELD course, an advanced ELD course to the junior high school, we'd need to make sure that we have appropriate materials for that class. Um, so that's sort of, I think, at the base level that, and did you want to add? Yeah, and uh, in terms of data, eventually we would love to see, you know, again, what we, what we always want to see. We want to see an increase in reclassification. Um, we want to see an increase in our language scores. But we do have a legal responsibility to provide ELD um, to students in need. Um, and that is, that is our responsibility. But this is an a, as at a base level. On a, on a grander scale, we would want to see an increase in our data. Right, but this is an addition to what we're already providing. This is to complete the series of what we're providing. So, um, for instance, right, we've got different levels of ELD. And so if we were to only say we're only going to offer beginner ELD and then get audited, uh, that would be an audit finding. That would be inappropriate to be giving ELD 1 instruction to ELD 4 students, for, let's say. And I think I'm using SALT numbers there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that shows my age a little bit. Yeah. But um, So we have a responsibility to offer at the level that the student's at. Thank you. Member Grindel? I just want to reiterate, and uh, if you can confirm, this is really a, sort of a technical filling out of what, we're, what we've been doing. It's not really a change in course. No. I think there was a testing of, like, is this program the right program? And I think there was just a, a sort of a blip on what was actually formally adopted, and it should have said the full series, and it didn't, and I didn't want to move forward without your approval. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification. Um, with that, uh, may we have a motion to approve? Madam President, I move that we approve the ELD Curriculum Adoption Amendment. Motion made by Member Marquez, seconded by myself. Um, how do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes. Five eyes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, on to new business, item 13.1, Board Policy and Administration Regulation 3551 Food Service Operations Cafeteria Fund. First reading. Thank you, President Wynn. I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Delacruz. Uh, this board policy is an update to the Food Service Operations Regulations. It needs to be update, updated um, for the upcoming audit that they're scheduled for. Are there, are there any questions or comments from the board? Are there any findings in the documentation that needs to be um, changed or, or brought back for a second reading? Or are we ready to make a motion to approve? Madam President, motion to approve. Okay. Um, motion made by Member Marquez. May I get a second, please? I'll second. Seconded by Member Grindel. Um, Member, Mar Member Zhang stepped out. Should we wait for him to vote, or can we move forward? Move forward. Okay. Member Marquez? Yes. Member, Member Zhang, we uh, move to approve? Yes. Thank you, Member Zhang. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes. Five eyes. Thank you, Ms. De La Cruz. On to item 13.2, resolution 2021.22.40, PG&E easement for electric vehicle charging stations. I will hand it over to you, Ms. Dela Cruz. Thank you, President Wynn. This board item is to approve a resolution that will provide uh, PG&E uh, easement to um, the area in our maintenance yard so they can 
provide the power to the charging stations. This is related to um, a couple of grants that we received and the board approved related to um, electric buses that we purchased as well as uh, charging stations that PG&E is, is helping to pay for. So in order for them to start, we just need to give them access to our property, basically. Thank you so much. Any comments or questions? Member Zhang? Member Marquez? None at this time. Member Hill? Yeah, thank you. Just a quick question. So is there any cost impact to the district in voting for this um, resolution and this easement? So, so I believe it's 45,000, but we're looking for the grant, right? That was the question answered before the school board meeting. Yes, so we are um, committed as part of our condition to accept the grant with PG&E to add three more charging stations, and the estimated cost for that is about 45,000. The first two are um, covered by grants that we already received. So maybe just a clarification, because I know that we made a decision earlier, so it sounds like what you're saying is, is that the decision that we already made has committed us to an additional 45000 or whatever if we don't get these grants. Yes, you can look at it right, that way. So that, mm -hmm. so that was that was the prior decision. My mm -hmm. question is, is this resolution and this easement, mm -hmm. is there any additional cost that we're committing to through this? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the interesting thing I want to ask is, if each charge is twenty five thousand, then why the additional the additional three will be total forty five thousand? That's why initially on the email I thought it's seventy five thousand. Right. So the um, the first grant that we received, the seventy seven thousand, will um, provide you know the the basic foundation for the for the chargers, so that we don't have those costs for the next two. Yeah. Member, Member Grindel? Uh, yes, I just wanted to, um, just wanted to, to compliment staff for this, for bringing this item forward and, and for um, moving us towards a more sustainable um, uh, transportation network. Um, I also um, am glad to see that there's a quit claim requirement if PG&E contract is, is yes. we, don't, we don't want to have this entangling us working with another pr uh, provider, so I uh, compliment you on including that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't have any other comments. My other board members pretty much <laughs> so, <laughs> summed so, it all up. So oh. <laughs> one last part about mm -hmm. the, the additional cost. I guess mm -hmm. there's this nominal or minimal cost on that, our commitment of maintaining the, I guess, the, the maintenance work, which, is, which will be part of our routine maintenance cost, right? Yes, that's correct. And right now, there are no trees or bushes around this area. There might be trees on the other side of the fence, but it's further away from the property and the area that they're proposing to install the charging station. Thank you. Any, any other comments, Member Zhang? No, I'm ready to make the motion. Okay, would you make the motion? I move that we approve resolution 2021.22.40. May I get a second, please? I second. Motion made by Member Zhang, seconded by Member Marquez. How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also yes. Um, five ayes. Thank you. Okay, on to item 13.3, Newark Junior High School Paving and Striping Project. Dr. Triplett. Thank you, President Wen. Um, do we have any uh, guests for this, um, Ms. Stella, Chris? Yes, I do have um, our representative from RGMK available for uh, to answer any questions. Great. So um, this item is uh, with regard to the um, paving and striping at the junior high school. Um, we do have considerable um, areas of the uh, parking lot and the, um, the route for student drop-off that are in dire need of repair. Um, you will notice on here that, um, and Ms. Stella Cruz will probably speak more on this, but that this is for um, really for repair and not completely overhauling the, um, the parking lot. Um, and we made that decision um, from a, a frugal standpoint that uh, the cost of doing the complete overhaul would be significantly more expensive. However, um, do welcome 
uh, board input into um, whether uh, it's more advisable to um, to overhaul the entire uh, parking lot rather than just some repairs. There's obvious trade-offs, um, but I do think that uh, we, we're coming forth with the recommendation as it is because we do have so many other significant needs that while um, it would be nice to completely um, renovate the um, renovate the parking lot. Um, we also recognize that there are so many other needs across the district that um, we're just thinking in that way. But I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Dela Cruz to add anything. Yes, as uh, Dr. Triplett mentioned, the condition of the parking lot as well as the main drive, uh, main drive-through is in really bad condition right now. Um, this was part of our deferred maintenance on part of our, our list of deferred maintenance projects. And um, the, the striping right now is uh, really faded and the parking spaces in the parking lot are not clearly marked. And plus, because of the solar project, we had to incorporate some ADA compliant parking spaces. So um, we had to redo it anyway. And the proposed um, striping plan right now does provide for uh, a better flow of traffic as well as provides uh, a second um, drop-off area in addition to the main main drive drive-through. So what we're proposing, as Dr. Shiplet mentioned, is um, the main drive-through would be completely replaced, but in the parking lot we'll be just doing uh, a lot of patchwork on the areas that are really um, badly like damaged in terms of maybe potholes and some alligator type um, cracks that are that are occurring right now. So in order to the estimate for this scope of work is three hundred and eleven thousand, um, but if we were to completely um, repair and replace the drive-through as well as the entire parking lot and restripe it. The estimate's about seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, comments or questions? Member Zhang? So once we we do this, once we complete the third three hundred eleven thousand, I mean the the remaining does the remaining really strictly equal to this seven hundred fifty thousand minus this amount or is more than that? Because you are separating the two projects rather than doing it as a whole. I'm sorry, is it in the... So, so I understand the total cost of completely revamp this is mm -hmm. 700 to 800,000. Mm -hmm. But if we approve this 311,000 today, that means you are, we're sort of splitting this into multiple parts. So does that really... Because sometimes when you split something into multiple parts, you actually uh, incur additional costs. Mm -hmm. My question is, if we do 311,000 today, is the is the remaining cost strictly the difference between 800,000 and this number? Yeah, so um, what I might suggest is if you're thinking about considering the total replacement as a possibility, then um, you can change the recommendations so that it would allow for uh, the board to accept an alternate bid, because the way that we bid it is the base would be the repair you know, based on the 300, but there's also an add, an add alternate where um, it would include the total replacement. So then we would have a choice to accept just the base bid or the base plus the alternate. It, could, could I add yeah, a little bit? Because I, I think I understand your question, um, Member Jean. So um, it's not that we would only be doing for 300,000 half of the job. It would be doing that we'd be doing repairs versus complete overhaul. So, in other words, um, if we do ha the, the the half price one, then um, in I don't know if it's about four years or so, four or five years, maybe we'd have to be revisiting, maybe doing the complete overhaul, or um, doing more patchwork in some other areas, type of thing. Yeah, sure. Like when when you do this, it's just every couple of years you do the patchwork. Yeah. Until right. you you don't want to tolerate that anymore, and <laughs> exactly. you still end up spending 1.1 million and totally replace that. Yes, that's that's the sort of risk. Member Marquez, thank you. Um, 
my, my question was that difference of the 490,000, almost the 500,000, mm -hmm. with the change that we've just received, the budget, right? Have, have we started the process, has anyone started the process to see if any of the funds allocations that may be coming to us as a school district covered this additional cost if we were to go with the full 800,000 so that we would not be maybe in one-time monies or we, so that we would not be using the reserves or what we already have in place? Because it, it's, it's almost like I know, it, what I was trying to think of is thinking of like a Caltrans approach, right? Because you see a pothole on the 880, instead of fixing the entire lane, they just go out and do a little remedy, and then mm -hmm. two weeks right. later or a month later, the pothole's back, right? right? So I'm trying to think long term. What would be the better investment for, for the school district um, if we're doing our homework or if we're doing the research to find where we could come up with that other 490000 now knowing that you know, with the budget, what has just happened within the last week? Has that process started? It, with the um, the May revise, mm -hmm. so that's not for sure yet. Okay. So we can't really count on that. But, I mean, if it did come through, you could use that. Uh, not that I would recommend it because, really, this is a capital project that you would be, be better off using the restricted funds, um, Fund 40 for capital outlay. And it's not that we don't have the funding, it's just we're trying to spread it out, knowing that there's so many other projects that need to be done. Because we do have about eight, nine million dollars in Fund 40, um, and maybe another 10 million in our developer fee account. But the, the district is in dire need of so many other projects that we just want to make sure that um, we think about the other schools as well. Okay, so if I'm understanding correctly, then what we're looking for is to be equitable, right? To, to, to take care of many needs versus taking care of one and leaving the others waiting. Is that That's correct? That's right. I understand correctly? That's, that was thank our thinking. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Member Hill. Yeah, thank you, Ms. De La Cruz. Um, so I, I just have a question about, um, so this is a construction project. Um, I don't remember the... Um, the competitive bid limits, but they're, those, they're fairly small for a construction project. I think it's like, I don't know, 15 or 20,000. So obviously this would go out to competitive bid. Um, but then I guess my question is, is um, and I, I didn't really think to ask it before, but what is, so who's going to conduct this competitive bid and what's Mr. Caputo's role in this whole process? Yeah, so RGMK is um, already um, let it out to bid. Our Kafka limit is 200000 so this has to go out to formal bid. And in order for us to be able, in terms of timeline, um, just to make sure we catch the next two board meetings, um, we're kind of doing it all at the same time. And if the board had rejected it, then we would have rejected the bids. So it's, it's already out. Because so we're so we're having an outside consultant um, manage our bid process. In this case, yes. Okay, I mean, and he's done it for other things too. To yes, my recollection. Yes, he has. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and why don't we use staff for this? Well, right now we really don't have the capacity. Okay, um, and then and then so he helps us put to, put together the RFP. You know, and they put all, they put the bid specs together, the front end. Sure. They conduct all of the mandatory okay. bid walks. They meet with the the contractors. They do our bid openings. Um, there, there's a lot of work involved in in the whole bid process. Okay, and then um, and then we we pay him to manage this project or this process. Yes, for okay. planning and then managing the project. Yes, and 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 then he also acts as the as the as the manager for all these projects? The construction projects, yes, the ones that we contract for, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, aren't we needing to actually put his services out to bid also um, as it starts to achieve certain thresholds? Well, we contracted with RGMK um, a couple years ago when we um, contracted for the, the bond projects. And because, I mean, it is a professional service. It's not anything that's required to go out to bid. So um, the professional services limit, I think, is 99000 So have we paid him more than 99000 so far? Not in for professional services, not in, in that. For all of these for projects? For, like, architects and those types of services. 
construction services. So for all of these projects, we haven't paid him more than $99,000? I didn't say that. I said that the RFP and bidding process doesn't apply to like architect services, um, professional um, construction services. It's not, um, doesn't apply to, to those. You're saying that there's no there's no competitive bidding limits for that. I mean, there's an, there's not a threshold for when you have to put these out to bid. N not for the professional contracts. That's not true. That's not. Well, I checked with legal before we did this. You can you can get quotes. You can get you can do the RFP process, but it's not mandatory. Yeah, that's not according to Ed Code. Okay, thank you. Member Grindel. Um, <clears throat> thank you, President Nguyen. Um, all right, a couple things. Uh, so if this, if this were done in this sort of halfway, um, we'd end up with three different ages of striping out in the parking lot, right? We'd have the original, which is barely visible now. You'd have the stuff that was done for the, hand, for the, for the handicap work due to the um, over, and then you'd have a brand new striping in, in, other, in other places. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and it, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but just want to make sure that I'm clear. Would they all be, all different striping would be visible, or part of the striping process is you um, you remove the the original striping so that there's not all these cross. Oh, yeah, there wouldn't be any cross. As no, it no. Is, what do you I'm, mean? I'm referring to the fact that there'll be areas of the parking lot that have have the existing striping that is now because they're they're not being touched by this project. Right? There are, par there are parts of the parking lot that are not being addressed at all. Okay, so for the striping, um, the part that we wouldn't touch is the part that was already the new striping that was done um, for the solar project. So the, the entire rest but of the parking else, lot would be restriped? Everything else would be restriped. Because um, there's really nothing existing that we could keep other than what was done for the solar. I understand. That, that does raise other concerns of trying to stripe in uh, gravel. But um, the, um, the, so we also have a situation where you're looking at going back. And, and I, I do appreciate staff's desire to try to make our you know, precious dollars go far and across the district. Um, however, if we have to go back in three or four years and end up redoing all, all this work, um, then that really causes problems. That really causes concerns for me. I, I'd rather spend the money that we have and do it efficiently in a way that gives us a product that's going to have a longer life cycle. When you when you start looking at life like life cycle cost, this this three year fix doesn't really score very well. What, you know, I'm, I'm back of envelope, right? Um, so I'm I'm concerned about that. Um, I'd rather I'd rather spend the money that it takes to get it done properly. That's going to last. Uh, that's going to last the time. Um, in addition, in, in um, what I've experienced, um, when you have a project like that's a patch kind of project, your oppor the opportunities for change orders and cost overruns is much, much higher than if you do a project um, if you do a project in total, which you can really bid it out and provide the information. Is, is, that, is that your experience too? Yes, uh, that's, that's right. Yeah, because <laughs> I'd really rather, I'd really like to to get a contract that's done, um, and then we can hold the contractor to uh, accomplishing the clear objective, of, um, but not to be arguing of, well, I wasn't supposed to fix that pothole. Um, that's your problem, and um, and yeah, we striped on gravel, but and the wind blew it, blew it away. But that's that, that's too bad. It wasn't spec. So um, so I I. I'd like to see it done really properly. I'd rather invest the money now. Otherwise, really, this three hundred thousand, this three hundred and eleven thousand dollars is gone when we go back to do it in three or four years. Um, and maybe this is an emotional thing, but uh, that whatever, we're all human. Um, we're we're opening a new middle school. We're really we're really uh, inaugurating a new era for this facility, and it seems just odd to be doing it halfway. Um, I'd like to see us um, reach reach down and find a way to fund the whole project. I, I understand the best way to do that probably is to add it as an ad alternate into the bid that's into the RFP that's already out. Um, 
that makes that makes perfect sense. But I but I'd be very much in favor, assuming that it's in that price range. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be very much in favor of doing it properly one time with a life cycle of 10, 12 years, mm -hmm. rather than having to be doing whack a mole on um, on you know the, the Caltrans approach um, of throwing sand in in holes and it, it disappearing into somewhere. So. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I, th that's that's where I um, that's where I stand on this. Thank you. I'm also in agreement with with um, Member Grindell. I think that um, we should, you know, consider redoing the entire job and not piecemeal it, and um, be more efficient with the funding. Um, that way, we don't have to revisit it and make additional. Um, fixes or repairs later on. I just think that that would be, um, you know, using up more district funding, unnecessary funding. And then also, I do have an issue with the current striping as is. Um, I think that although, you know, we want to make the drop off, the, the, the green secondary drop off, um, you know, efficient for parents, but I think it would be best if the loop was just made all around and that we have singular striping um, for all the parking um, going, uh, you know, one direction and then having one exit pathway. And instead of having multiple, I could see people like trying to run, you know, and, and eliminating that middle, um, that middle entry right there. Okay. So anyways, those are just my two cents. But um, so... Yes, Member Hill. Yeah, so I, I think, and this is kind of to Ms. De La Cruz's earlier point, um, I think that we could be losing sight of the larger issue, which is that we have limited funds but lots of potential needs. And so I'm looking at Mr. Caputo's um, facilities maintenance plan that he brought forward. I don't know if it was the last session or the session before. Um, it basically built on the prior facilities maintenance plan the unfortunate thing is, is that he's listed out site priorities, but you know there's no real sort of order or or um, dollar amount that's associated with it. For it, so it's hard for us to to see. But I think that before we make a decision on one, we I, I would suggest that we get more information about this, and we actually maybe get some cost estimates for these things, and also maybe have a discussion about priorities. Because I'm just going to list off a few of them. I mean, we've got this one for the parking lot. We've got asphalt maintenance for playground and quad areas. We've got um, repair water fountains. We've got um, replace HVAC units and portables. We've got re re remove repair old portables. Um, we've got a whole variety of things here. And I'm just concerned that we could be zeroing in on this because it's on our current agenda item. And maybe we're no. inside to some larger. <laughs> There's definitely a need there. I but drop so, off my kids there. Right, it's but the question awful. is: is is it the most pressing need of all of yes. these? Yes. There can, okay, there's so, damages to people's cars and vehicles. Okay, yes. so that's your opinion. I mean, I'm just asking to say that I'd like to get more information before we vote on this. Member, Member Zhang, do you have any additional comments? Well, I would just say let's go out with the 800,000 bid and, and 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 bring it back next time. Member. Because we're talking about fund 40, right? These capital budget. I mean, you know, I mean, how much money are you losing every month in an inflationary environment by letting the funds sit idle? That's my question. Yes. Member Marquez, do you have any other comments? Um, I just want to thank my fellow board members for the amount of information that's been offered by each and every one of you because it's enlightened me and it's it's helping me see things differently. Um, it's, in my opinion, now currently. Um, after previously asking where the money would come from. Um, I feel that listening to my fellow board members, that it's better to take care of it now if we're able to, if we're in that capacity, versus patching. So thank you for everyone for your information. Thank you. Member Grindel, any additional comments? No, I'd like to make a motion. I'd like to make a motion when you're ready. Okay, um, go ahead. Um, I'd like to um, approve the staff recommendation with the addition of sending out the ad alternate for a complete um, repair replacement as indicated as uh, in the staff report. Make I'll it second that. Motion made by Member Grindel, seconded by Member Zhang. How do we vote? How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? No. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes. 
Um, four eyes and one no. Thank you. On to consent item, personnel items. Um, 14, may I get a motion to approve item 14.2, 14.3, and 14.4? I'd like to pull 14.4. Okay, um, we will pull 14.4. May I get a motion to approve 14.2 and 14.3? I move to approve 14.2 and 14.3. I Mo second. Motion made by Member Zhang, seconded by Member Marquez. How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also yes. Five ayes on uh, items 4.2 and 4.3. Um, item 4.4, .4, Member Hill? Yeah, so looking at the PAL and looking at the recommendation for um, basically filling the um, Director of, of Special Education, um, I just, I, I have a concern with the approach that we're taking. Uh, and this dates back to the concerns that I had echoed all the way from last year, which is that, um, that again, I really believe that it would be helpful to have board, um, if not involvement in um, the hiring of key positions, at least proper uh, briefing. Um, and we really haven't had either, um, and there's very little transparency. And, and my concern is that we know that we've had significant issues in our spe uh, special education area. Um, we get emails as a board all the time from parents about issues that have come up. Um, and then we've also um, had you know, numerous, um, basically, um, decisions that we've had to make to provide separate services because our district hasn't been capable of, of providing what's needed and um, at significant cost. And so, you know, we really need to bring in, in my opinion, you know, a very experienced person to come in and do a, um, you know, really kind of a turnaround in this area. Um, and, you know, with all due respect to the proposed candidate, um, so, again, I don't, I don't have any detailed knowledge, but I'm concerned that we're recruiting from within um, and, and not looking at all the potential best candidates. And as, as I've described before, um, if we want to go to the Super Bowl, the way you go to the Super Bowl is with the best players. And I want to make sure that we have the best players on our team, and I think that we're rushing this, and I'm concerned about it. So uh, oh. once, one comment I want to make is that on that position, the proposed candidate actually originally came from special education. Thank you, Member Zhang. Member Marquez, do you have any questions or comments? Two comments. So first and foremost, in recentering, um, when it comes to the hiring, and that's why we, as a board, have our, our superintendent. So when it comes to our superintendent having his executive committee, we need to we need to remember that this is this is the board as a board. This is the superintendent that we chose, and so we have our um, invested time and decision making when it comes to hoping that he makes the right choice for us when it comes to the hiring firing because it would be in, impossible for us as a board to find ourselves um, getting involved when it comes to the hiring because of the processes, if you do not have the background of knowing the laws in itself. Um, I was gonna hold this item for a little bit later, but since um, Board Member Hill introduced this, I just wanna go ahead and chime in. In looking at our fiscal year, February 1st, 2022, um, column step pay gallery for our teachers, um, and seeing the difference between 21 and 22 was roughly 1.5%. So I did some homework and I was looking at local school districts and we, we consider ourselves and we want to consider ourselves competitive. So going off of the comment that was made, in order for us to be competitive, we as a board need to support our HR department as well as our superintendent when it comes to not only negotiating, but looking at what the cost of living is. Mm -hmm. It was great news to see that it was actually at 6.56 Nicola versus the five. I was thinking we're, it was gonna be three, and here we are, double that, right? So when, if we want to be competitive, especially with our local and, and surrounding areas, I took a moment to look at what we have. So for example, um, English dual immersion Spanish teacher for 2022-23, Okay, starting off, 
55,000 to the 98,000 with an annual 10,000 retention bonus plus a 2,500 stipend if you hold a B-clad. Okay. This is for Spanish. Dual immersion Korean. 65,000 starting, and that's at the entry of the 30, uh, the BA plus the 30, with a 2,250 stipend for Korean. And then it goes on to show um, Mandarin, dual immersion. So we as a school district, right, in order to, in order, and as a, as a board of education, in order for us to maintain competitive and to retain the employees that we have, this is the type of homework that we need to do. What does it take for us to retain and to want someone like the current, the current candidate that we have in place that's willing to step in and apply for the director of special education? What is it that's keeping that um, current employee wanting to stay here? And those are the type of questions that I would hope that um, our executive board, along with um, superintendent, is actually asking during the process, the hiring process. So thank you, Member Hill, for opening up this conversation because in doing my homework, we have to maintain competitive, right? And I'm hoping that that 6.6 .6 is something that comes into fruition and that, that we see it, that dream or that number actually become a reality, all right? Because we need to maintain and retain excellent staff. Thank you. Thank you. Member, Member Grindel? Um, yes. Um, I was. I, I, thank you, Mr. Hill, for call, pulling this item. I, I wanted to uh, talk about two two issues as well. Uh, the first issue is I want. I was hoping the superintendent or um, or or other staff could describe the process that you use to fill um, these very very important positions. I, I do want to first state that I strongly support Member Marquez's concept that uh, we hire you to to do the to do this work. Um, but I would appreciate if you could explain to the board the process that you use. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'd be happy to, although I think Ms. Ingham Waters uh, probably can do an even better job than me <laughs> at explaining all of the different levels and layers of the, this, uh, this uh, process. So for our principal positions, we have, um, after Ed joined posting and screening for requirements, um, we invite qualified candidates to a performance-based interview. And that is a series of role plays and scenarios that principals will face in any given year, month, week, maybe some all in a day. Um, and we can really, instead of them just talking about what they can do, they actually can demonstrate it and show it. And so after that process, uh, district leadership uh, debrief and select really the best of the best to go into a pool. And then from there, we do a panel interview with uh, parity among the stakeholders. So we work collaboratively with our teachers union to have two NTA representatives. We work with CSEA leadership to have two CSEA representatives, two administrators, as well as two parents and we try to have variety there. That is more of a traditional panel interview with questions and answers that stay consistent for all of the candidates. We have a ranking system and, and we debrief. Um, we will, as an advisory panel, they're not the hiring panel, they're advisory. They will recommend a number of candidates to move on to the next round, which is with executive cabinet and that's obviously with executive cabinet, um, which have different sets of questions, maybe follow up, maybe more information wanting, wanting uh, to be known about them from the panel. We can personalize the, the next level. Um, we also do thorough reference calls um, and bef before we make the offer. Great, well thank you, I appreciate that. Um, appreciate the, the explanation. Um, and the the other the other point I was was going to make I was going to I was going to pull this for this reason if Member Hill hadn't beat me to it, um, which is really just to con congratulate uh, these educators for these for their for their interest in and their and their selection for these positions. We're we're really excited to have such high quality people in our um, in our district. And I I disagree completely with Member Hill on this and other things. <laughs> um, and I believe that if you can grow your own people and, and 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 hire your own people that's a that's a net positive not a negative 
Member Hill. Yeah, again, um, I, I know that many people um, up here on the dais, as well as probably in the audience, are Warriors fans. Um, and, I pro and the Warriors are in the championships. And I promise you that um, the general manager and the leadership of the Warriors are involved in the hiring of key positions. Um, and so that not only is that true in professional sports, but it's also true across corporate America and across all corporate boards. So, um, I th and I think that we, if we're going to become a great district, that we, the board, need to get more involved and that we need to really make sure that we're recruiting the best um, to, to take us to the heights that we want to achieve. Um, I just wanted to add one more detail about the process. Um, we also held uh, input sessions. I hosted um, sessions with all interested staff at the site level, um, focusing on what characteristics and attributes uh, they, they desire for their next principal, as well as what are the needs of the school and, and kind of the vision moving forward. We also hosted Zoom community engagement nights with the same kind of process and task. And so those questions and those feedback were also a data point in creating rigorous questions, uh, as well as you know listening to the details in the candidate's answers. Just wanted to include that as well. OK, lastly, uh, I'm ready to make a motion if there's no other comments. But I just wanted to remind Member Hill, our GM is the superintendent. So we do put all of you know, our faith into the superintendent while he makes these decisions with his executive team. So I just wanted to appreciate them for all their hard work and effort into, um, you know, um, doing all the interviews for the staff. So with that, I'd like to make a motion to approve the, the personnel uh, report. Make it a second, please. I second it. Um, motion made by myself and um, seconded by Member Zhang. Member Zhang, how do you vote? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member yeah. Hill? No. Member Rendell? Yes. I'm a yes as well. Four ayes and one no. Thank, Thank you, you, President Wynn. And um, if, if, we, if we may, we'd like to introduce um, the, the two principals and the director of special education um, and say a few words. And so um, with your permission, I'd love to start by inviting uh, Ms. Elba Herrera to come up to the uh, stage. So, we, um, Ms. Herrera, if, you, if you'd allow me, I'm going to say a few words and then I'd love to hear from you as well. Sure. <laughs> so, we're just really, really delighted, excited that um, to, to have Ms. Uh, Herrera become the new principal of Schilling. Um, I'll say a little bit about her. Um, Elba is, was born and raised in the East Bay and is a product of public school education. She currently lives in Hayward with her husband and two children, one of which I believe is here with us tonight. Um, Elba Herrera has served the Newark Unified School District for over 25 years, working as an elementary school teacher supporting Schilling Elementary. Since the beginning of her career, she has been dedicated to Schilling Elementary and student achievement making sure students get a rigorous education. These past three years, she has been the administrative designee, supporting staff and students um, in the absence of her principal. She has been a mentor for the NUSD induction program for the past seven years, supporting and guiding new teachers with challenges they face through their first years of teaching. She has assisted Schilling Elementary to achieve platinum PBIS status, currently the only school in our district to do so, and Elba is trained in the um, Sobrato Early Academic Language, or SEAL model, which we've spoken to this board about, which is used to improve literacy outcomes for monolingual, bilingual, and trilingual students. These past two years, she has led and supported the development of the Dual Language Immersion Program, recently implemented at her school, and she is, uh, one, has been one of the teachers in that program. Elba is passionate about being an advocate for education focused on offering support to all students and staff, promoting commitment, and sharing a sense of responsibility for implementing change. As principal at Schilling Elementary, she has high expectations to secure a successful DLI pro program and to ensure that all students are meeting academic success. And I will say that um, I, I uh, appreciate some of the comments of board members. We. Uh, 
couldn't be more delighted to be hiring from within and um, hiring from um, candidates who have shown a lifetime of dedication to our district. It's tremendous. Um, we have been, we, we are hiring rock stars and, um, and future champions. And uh, I, I am proud of our HR department as well because this year, um, we, we already had a rigorous process, but this, this year the process has become even more rigorous. So with that, I just want to, um, if you all could join me again in applause for Ms. Elba Herrera. Thank you so much. Good evening, Dr. Triplett, board members, cabinet members, and community members. It is my pleasure and honor to int introduce myself as principal for Schilling Elementary School. I am extremely proud and excited to make my transition from teacher to principal at the very school where I started my career 25 years ago. I look forward to working with the staff, the students, the families, and the school community to make sure we focus on student achievement. I am dedicated. I am dedicated to continuing our students' success and will strive to continue the positive relationships, rigorous learning, and continue to encourage our students to celebrate their unique strengths. Es un gran placer poder asistir a la comunidad de Schilling y el distrito de Newark. Estoy aquí para servirles. Thank you for your time and support. Muchas gracias, directora Herrera. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to call up uh, Ms. Christy Palomino. <laughs> so Christy Palomino grew up in Newark. Uh, she's an alumni of Russian Elementary, of McGregor Elementary, of Newark Junior High, and Newark Memorial High School. <laughs> Uh, Mrs. Palomino attended San Francisco State, San Jose State, Ohio State, and Cal State Hayward for her teaching credentials and her administrative leadership roles. Mrs. Palomino has been a dedicated NUSD employee for 27 years. Well, wow, sorry, Ms. Herrera, she's got your feet. <laughs> and 26 of those years spent serving the Snow Elementary community before the merger of Coy into Coyote Hills Elementary this year. She began teaching at Snow in 1995 and served as a teacher, literacy coordinator, BITSA mentor, administrative designee, and interim principal at Snow Elementary and now Coyote Hills Elementary. Mrs. Palomino is devoted to the school community and, serve, and continues to serve as in, on several leadership teams and various district level committees, such as the Curriculum Council, Essential Standards Committees, Curriculum Adoption Committees, BITSA Coach, Mentor Committee, Peer Coach, Teacher, you're going to have to give up some of these, Ms. Tolman. <laughs> <laughs> Report Card Committee, Induction Support Provider, and Core Literature Units Committees. Throughout the Snow and Graham merger process, Mrs. Palomino has gone above and beyond to advocate for our newly merged community and has served as a teacher leader to promote positive experiences for our staff and students this year. She served as an active member of the Snow and Graham de design team last year and has continued to work hard to help build positive relationships amongst our staff, students, and parents this year. Mrs. Palomino has worked collaboratively with others on our staff to problem solve and to support during this challenging school year. And as the current interim principal of Coyote Hills, Mrs. Palomino has put into place weekly communication with staff and parents with opportunities such as Tuesday announcements and weekly community letters to families and the community of uh, Cody Hills. She makes herself present in classrooms and all the learning taking place at Coyote Hills. And Mrs. Palomino comes to work every day with a positive attitude and spreads joy across our campus. So Mrs. Palomino is looking forward to continuing to create a caring and safe school where every student feels validated and strives for their personal best each and every day with the support of all Coyote Hills staff. So please join me in wel re welcoming her. Well, Dr. Triplett and board, thank you so much for believing in me, for having the faith to give me this incredible opportunity to give back to the community I was raised in and I became an educator in. My passion is truly for kids. I believe all kids can learn, given the right opportunities, provided the equity and support they need. 
So making kids feel safe at school is critical this year, and I've really focused on cell for our kiddos. That We've merged these two schools. We're building this new community. It's been a bumpy road, but we've made a lot of growth and progress, and I really want to see our vision come to life and continue to grow our Coyote Hills elementary community. So thank you so very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Palomino. And last but certainly not least, I would like to call up uh, currently Principal Rangel, but soon, uh, now soon to be Director of Special Education Rangel. <laughs> so um, I do want to start by, Olivia has worked in Newark Unified since 2011. Um, which uh, that's 11 or 12 years, but um, I do want to say that in high school years, that's probably like 30, 36 <laughs> years. <laughs> so um, prior to her work in Newark, she worked as a paraprofessional and inclusion specialist. She began her career here as an SDC special education teacher at Newark Memorial. This is where she developed her love for the Cougar community and Newark. Over the years, she began to take on further leadership roles such as lead teacher and program specialist, and then ultimately proudly served and is serving as the principal of our flagship high school, Newark Memorial. Olivia looks forward to continuing to serve this community in her area of expertise and, um, and also deep passion, special education. She is ready to support all members that serve the special education community with best practices, increased inclusion, and balanced leadership. She looks forward to working with new and familiar families to provide the best education for our most deserving students. And I just want to say, um, I, I personally feel like um, one of the in most important criteria for uh, district leadership is for someone to have sat in the seat of principal, because until you have, have been principal, um, it's really hard to fully understand how to support principals. And so I'm really delighted that Olivia is coming back to special education, having had that experience um, in, in the high school as the leader. So please uh, join me in welcoming Olivia Rangel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Triplett, board and executive cabinet. It is, I am standing up here with some mixed emotions because I have proudly served the students of Newark Memorial for the last three years. Every time. I knew I was going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start. I know. <laughs> um, I proudly serve the intelligent, respectful, driven, and compassionate students who've made my job at Newark Memorial easy. I've appreciated working with the staff and longtime behind the scene leaders who've motivated and inspired the students to be better. All of these students and staff have supported me along the way and were, were collaborative when I needed them most. Thus to say, this decision to step back into my dream job was not an easy one. But ultimately, we ask our students to reach for their dreams. And today, I get to do that in my new role. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm proud to be able to provide this department with stability, improvement, compliance, and best instructional practices for our most deserving students and our most vulnerable students. I know it seems like I don't have a lot of experience in this role, but I have a lot of experience in this community. And this community has developed a lot of trust in me to do this job and do right by our kids. And I will continue to do what I've done for the last 11 years for this community. So again, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much um, to all of our wonderful, no longer interim principals, <laughs> Ms. Herrera and Ms. Palomino, and um, to Ms. Rangel, congratulations on um, getting your dream job. And uh, we have huge expectations, <laughs> to say the least, but I'm very confident that with your all of your um, passion and drive that um, we will see a lot of success through um, 
you moving forward in those positions. So thank you so much. Okay, um, on to um, consent agenda items. We do have public speaker for items 15.10 and 15.11. So we'll pull those. And is there any additional items that um, board members like to pull? Member, member help? See a 15.11. Oh, Sorry. we had an amendment oh, to the agenda. Thank you. The 15.11 is for the Kennedy, Kennedy field trip. Thank you. So I'd like to pull 15.2, 15.6, 15.8, and 15.9, please. 15.2, 15.6, 15.8, 15.9, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.11, 15.
So 15.6, the Think Together contracts. Um, so we've talked about this before. So we've had a, uh, an after-school program. Um, we went through some pretty severe cuts a couple of months ago that basically, um, you know, if they're finalized, uh, for the most part, eliminate that program, right? There's not going to be enough personnel to run it. And, and even though we're saying that um, Think Together is different, um, but it's, it seems that we're really using it as a quasi-substitute to provide um, after-school services. Um, and it's a pretty hefty price tag, right? So we're talking about 1.6, almost $1.7 million. Um, and the, the challenge that, that I have with this is that it's, it's not apples to apples um, in a lot of respects. Not only is it, I mean, because essentially it's proclaiming that um, we're going to be doing, you know, again, some, some we're, we're going to be including some academic content or some, um, you know, curricular activities as a part of this. The challenge, though, that we face and where I think that we really need to be treading carefully as a district is it's my understanding that Think Together only provides after school services. Um, it doesn't provide um, basically early drop off at any of the schools, uh, whereas our current after our, our, our current um, you know, essentially, quote unquote, after school program actually provides both. And I think the thing that we should be thinking about is that, as we all know, we have an enrollment issue and a declining enrollment issue, and we're trying to recruit a lot of parents, um, new parents and kids into the school. I think that many of the ones that we're trying to recruit are working professionals and being able to have um, the ability to drop off your kid early is a pretty critical um, function if we're going to be attracting them and if we get rid of our after-school program um, and substitute this um, in its place it's going to be challenging the the second issue that I have with this is that this is being funded with grant funds um, and so we're um, you know we can see that this can 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 be um, funded over the next year maybe maybe two but after that if these funds disappear you know, what are we going to do about our um, after school child care program um, or b before and after school? And, you know, and are we going to be in a situation where we're going to then have to try to rebuild? And are we going to be even further behind the eight, eight ball? Um, and so, you know, I, I'd, I'd appreciate some um, feedback from staff in terms of how we're going to address if we eliminate our child care program and we substitute this in as a quasi substitute, how we're going to deal with kids that need to be dropped off before school starts. Um, and then secondly, how are we going to um, fund this important activity that I think it really is a tie to future enrollment after these funds disappear. So those are my two questions. Superintendent Triplett. Sure. Thank you for those uh, questions, Member Hill. Um, so the, that is correct that this is not a uh, early drop-off program and um, and so uh, that's something that um, this this um, think together does not provide so uh, it's not part of um, not part of this agenda item um, when referencing the current after-school program so th this is the current after-school program um, this is an after-school provider uh, at two school or three schools currently, one um, the junior high, one Chilling, and one um, at Coyote Hills. We do. Um, I think you are referring to our child care program, which is uh, which is child care. It's not after school program, um, and uh, it has not been uh, child care program has not been eliminated. Um, we're currently in conversations with uh, the um, our uh, labor partners with regard to um, how to make sure that we are um, continuing to provide the important services that uh, that child care does provide. Um, and in particular, the early drop-off is one of those important services. In terms of funding with grant funds, so these are ongoing funds from the state. So this, uh, these funds don't have a, uh, um, a time limit, and the expectation is that they will continue um, as is. Any, any additions to that, uh, team? 
could you, could you just give us a little bit of insight? Because when we um, had to approve all the layoffs and we looked at the, uh, and thank you for, for correcting my terminology, I meant child care. Um, but when we, when we were approving these notices and these layoffs, it looked like we were only going to have about two people left in the child care program. So has that changed since we last um, looked at that, uh, at that data? So th this is um, this agenda item is not uh, related to the child care program. Um, we are, like I said, in conversations with our labor partners right now with regard to um, trying to make sure that we do provide the, the, the best services to our families with regard to early drop off, um, as well as some of the other services that uh, provided by child care. So um, we, we have not eliminated child care, um, but we, uh, we, we are um, uh, taking advantage of this grant. Um, and uh, this grant provides for the type of services that are articulated by Think Together. Um, I will also just say that this, the board did approve this, this grant plan. So this is merely the contract uh, to back up what the board approved um, earlier this year. Thank you, Dr. Triplett. Um, with that, Member Marquez, do you have a comment? Just one comment. I, I did want to um, compliment the fact that, you know, that we're moving on, not just three schools, that we're moving into mm -hmm. the, fourth, the fourth campus. And the fact that we have um, these opportunities available for all of our campus would, would be a, a great goal to strive towards, as long as there is the funding available and it's continuous um, to, to create equity for all the students so that they can also um, receive the benefits of these programs because not only are they working with them with SEL and enrichment, but they're also um, the staff that works for these, these particular type of programs are also prepared to, to assist our students academically. So kudos. Thank you. With that, um, I'd like to move to approve. A second. Um, motion made by myself and seconded by Member Zhang. How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? No. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes. Four ayes and one no. On to item 15.8, Member Hill. The moving services contract. Yes, the moving, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, um, moving services contract. So, um, I see that we, um, I understand that we need to do a move. Um, it looks like we put together an RFP um, and got bids, and we got looks like we got two bids and uh, may, maybe more. Do we only have two bids? We only have two bids that were responsive. Uh, the third one was not responsive, meaning they were supposed to submit it here, and they submitted it by email. Okay. Um, and so the ones that were responsive, one was for 77,000, the other one was for 52,000. We're going with the one for 52,000. My question is, um, why are we sending this out for RFP? So we wanted to give um, potential moving contractors the opportunity to um, look at the, the scope of work and provide us a quote. So normally we get quotes, you know, one or two, and it's a project this size. And um, so we decided to do an RFP. Okay. Um, because the part that I'm confused about is, um, I mean, when you, when you guys submitted to us last year, um, when we were talking about delegation of authority and pro procurement practices, et cetera, you provided to us the procurement policy that the district is following. Um, and, um, and in that, when it comes to services, and this is one of the things that you've been maintaining, is that when it comes to services, you've maintained, I'm not sure if this is 100% correct, but according to, the, to our policy, it says, for services, anything under $99,000 doesn't have to go out to bid. So why are we making an exception here? This is an informal. We can do informal bids. Okay. But you, but you set, sent out an RFP. Isn't that a formal process? Not necessarily. So if it was um, formal, we would have advertised and done the formal process 
Just because it's called an RFP doesn't make it formal. Okay, so then we pre-identified a couple of vendors that we wanted to have bid on this. Yes. Okay, but we didn't make it open for public bidding. Well, it's, uh, it's on our website, so I'm not sure what you mean. So we normally will put it on our, on our website. But if it's on the website, so then it's published. We, right. we take every, okay. we, we do what we can to... Um, While I understand the line of questioning from Member Hill, I just hope that, Member Hill, if you could read over the governance handbook and ask these questions to staff for clarification prior to the board meetings so that they are prepared to answer any of the additional questions you may have in, in relations to all of these, the processes. Yes, so, so, I, so I actually um, had questions about this and I sent uh, to Dr. Triplett, I said I would like to see the RFP um, so that I could understand more about the process. And so I submitted that yesterday um, and got the RFP, and so I'm now only having time to, you know, come back as I've looked further at this. So I, I have been following the okay, process. Great. Thank you so much. Um, with that, is there any additional comments from the board? Member Zhang, do you have anything? No, ready to make the motion. Okay, great. Uh, motion made by Member Zhang. May I get a second? I'd second. Second. Oh. <laughs> Seconded by Member Marquez. How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also a yes. Five ayes. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 15.9, you have the floor again, Mr. Hill. Member Hill? Oh, this is the one that has a public comment. Oh, no. Um, 15, Are we on 10 or 9? No, we're on 9. 15.9. Member Hill, it's the warrant report. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I, I had two questions about this, um, and one of them was a was a follow up. One of them was a follow up from the last session, and so and I didn't have the information handy in front of me, um, but I noticed that the same topic came up again in this warrant report. So um, can can you guys tell me? I mean, what what is this Learning Leadership Academy? Which item is that? Oh, LLA. Are you talking about the Leadership Learning Academy? Yes. Uh, yeah, so um, we've, I, I believe we've uh, talked about this with the board in the past. So um, part of our professional development for our principals is a bi-monthly, bi um, uh, what we call a Leadership Learning Academy. And um, it's a... Uh, half, essentially like a half day, a morning time, where all the principals meet together and uh, we support their professional growth. And um, so I, I, I don't have the um, item that you're referring to, but I'm going to guess that it's a, um, it's a uh, uh, food item. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so what I'm noticing, I mean, and, and so again, I, I saw this, I was curious about it. And then when I saw it again, you know, wanted to sort of look a little bit further. And um, so it seems that we've, in, we've been incurring, uh, incurring a lot of charges here. Um, and so on September 2021, LLA um, meeting, $290. On um, October 1st, um, LA, so this uh, LA, uh, LLA meeting, $314. On 11-2-21 um, to $171 to the Mexican tor uh, Mexico Tortilla Factory. On November 21st, LOA breakfast, $155. On December 8th, um, LLL meeting, $221. On um, January of this year, LLA meeting, 137 So basically all the way up to the present. Um, and so... It seems that we're um, catering food to these meetings. Um, and then as I look at the account stream code, and I'm still kind of learning how all this stuff works, but I'm understanding that this is coming from donation money. Um, and, you know, it's, it's my understanding, actually, that both in terms of um, our, our, our policies that we formally adopted, as, whether, as well as other guidance in ed code, that these are actually inappropriate expenditures. Um, 
And if I, let's see if I can find the actual specifics here. So we have a policy, 3,300 expenditures and purchases. It says the government governing board recognizes its fiduciary responsibility to oversee the prudent expenditure of district funds in order to best serve district interests. The, the superintendent or designee shall develop and maintain effective purchasing procedures that are consistent with sound financial controls. Um, if you go further into this policy, and this policy was adopted, originally adopted in 1996 and was last revised in 2018, it says um, the superintendent or designee may authorize expenditures for light refreshments for in-service and or award meetings in which staff, students, volunteers, and parents or guardians participate as a part of the educational program. The cost of light refreshments will not exceed $760 for breakfast, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so my concern is, is that, you know, are these basically a gift of public funds? Um, and um, again, I mean, you know, we, we've been talking earlier about how we understand that there's a deficit and we understand that, you know, and that we've made resolutions to, um, you know, basically commit to change our structural deficit. But in my experience, everything that I've learned in business is that you count the pennies and the dollars take care of themselves. Um, and yet what I see constantly is I see, I hear us mouth the words that we understand the deficit and we're gonna take action. And yet we're engaging in really you know, inappropriate behavior here. Um, and I actually think that this, this violates our policies. Um, so I just, I'd kind of like to get um, you know, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe you can provide more detail to me, Dr. Triplin, on this. Uh, yeah, so if, if you can, um, uh, the, the policy that you read, um, I think, um, really articulates well how this, this purchase or expense is in alignment um, with, with policy. So I'm not really clear on how that yeah, would represent So I'll, I'll, read, it, I'll read it again, because I know I read it fast. It's okay. No, I so, got, I got so, it first. So let, let's I, just, did, yeah. I, I think we want to make sure that we understand. So what it says is, the superintendent or designee may authorize expenditures for light refreshments for in-service and or award meetings in which staff, students, volunteers, parents, guardians participate. All right, it's not for breakfast meetings for staff uh, we don't do catering to our employees. And I can tell you that in my district, they don't do that either. Um, that, um, and, and so again, I don't think that we're living up to the policy. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ms. Delacruz, but in service uh, is the definition of uh, professional development for, uh, for staff. So that, that is uh, in alignment with that policy. Yes. So, so the seven, There's six nothing per inappropriate person? in the purchases that have been made. So all of these expenses have to do with, with the meetings and the in-services and the professional development that, um, that we conduct. The Learning Academy is a professional growth development meeting. The, um, the other LLAs, that's what they are. They're, they're meetings to help our staff and our administrators develop and grow as professionals. So there's nothing inappropriate. So seven sixty for breakfast. Thank you. Um, with that said, I'm ready to make a motion. Member Zhang, make it a second, or so for many wait, other wait, members. I have one, one other item. One other There's item. already yeah, a motion on the so table. Ma'am, ma ma point of order. It's, there is no point of order. Yes, I made a have, motion. We don't have parliamentary procedure here. No, okay? we don't. There we is do no have parliamentary no, procedure. Not. And no, we states that we... So, ma'am, I have one other warrant that I would like to... You, you point know, of order. Okay, so There's a motion on the floor. Okay, so, ma Thank I'm you. Gonna, I'm going to read to you from the... Make it a second, please. I'm going to read to you from the governance manual right now because apparently you haven't read it. Okay, so I'm happy to read this to you. So, it says right here, okay, in terms of duties of board officers, the okay, president my of the died. board, okay, um, it says right here, that you are supposed to enforce and maintain the board's policies related to the order of business and the And I am. Meetings. Thank you. And, excuse me. And the last, the second to last bullet point is rule on parliamentary procedure. Okay, that's what it says right here. It doesn't say rule on what's in the governance handbook. It doesn't say rule on 
something else. It says rule on parliamentary procedure. Yes, so the, the parliamentary procedures that we have already approved there, as a there, board. There it's the no governance handbook. There are, Thank you. There are no parliamentary procedures in this governance handbook. And until we adopt these, you cannot continue to act like a tyrant. No, you are Thank the tyrant. You, Thank I, you. I have one additional issue. I would like to know why we are going out and renting facilities for retirement parties when we aren't using our own. And there's a warrant in there to go out and, and basically hold an event at the Portuguese Club for $700, and then there's additional, there's additional rent costs for renting tables. We have ample space, so I don't see how we are walking the talk in terms of saying that we're trying to work on our structural deficit when we are, when we are fritting away money in a variety of areas. Thank you. I still move to approve the, the warrant report. May I please get a second? I'll second it. Motion made by myself and seconded by Member Zhang. Member Zhang, how do you vote? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? No. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm a yes. Four ayes and one no. Ms. Parks, I apologize. We should have allowed you to go first. Um, item 15.10, minutes. Now you are direct, my night. I was supposed to be at home with my grandkids. But at the very beginning of this meeting, and I happened to watch the very beginning to see if these minutes were pulled because of the typographical error, which meant I had to foist my grandkids on my husband to put them to bed so that I could be here to address this item. You know that you have, for a regular meeting, you have to post your agenda 72 hours in advance. You cannot deviate from the items that are before you that are on that agenda that list the items that you're going to determine you're going to vote on 72 hours in advance for a regular meeting. If it were a special meeting, that's 24 hours. Emergencies are catastrophic. 15.10 is your minutes dated today. Clearly, that's a typographical error. When the agenda came out, the minutes were not attached. So anybody who looked at the agenda, and even Ms. Marzano here was questioning me on why the minutes would say that they were for today. So you've told the community that they were going, you were going to approve the minutes for tonight. So to listen to the discussion at the beginning of this meeting where you were going to approve the agenda and listen to the conversation blowing off the fact that, and nobody really taking ownership for the typographical error and saying, well, in your motion or however, the, whatever the terminology was, I was so uh, um, angry when I heard that this was just being belittled that way. You can't just change the ag agenda item. You can't just say, okay, we're going to not motion to approve the May 19th uh, meeting minutes. We're going to now say that they're the May 5th. That doesn't work. You need to pull them, and you need to bring them back at your next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you also have the floor. Oh, are we going to be pulling yes, this no, item? Just wait. Are you voting on that? Just wait. Yeah. Separate item. Yeah. <clears throat> yes, thank you. It's been a long night. Thank you. Madam President? Yes, Member um, Rendell. Out of an abundance of transparency, I'd like to move that we continue this to the next meeting, given that there's no urgency. Okay, perfect. We can pull this item. Okay, on to item 1511. Do we need a motion on that? Or? Do we need a motion on no. that? No. 1511, Ms. Parks. I repeat everything I just said regarding your agenda. And I have to say that it's very disturbing to me to listen that there was some kind of a mistake made to where this item was left off the agenda and that this field trip is scheduled for tomorrow. And don't think that it doesn't make me sick that I had to listen to what I did at the very beginning of this meeting and have it be deemed an emergency. An emergency according to the Brown Act, is where you, the only terminology is, is when you're having an emergency meeting. 
and that emergency meeting means that it, was a, it has to do with a crippling disaster, a mass destruction, terrorist act, threatening terrorist activity that poses peril. It's not an emergency to add another item. You've been in other Brown Act committee meetings where you don't get to just add an item. It has to be, I mean, you just don't add an item. You just don't get to do that. You have a protocol. You, ha you have law that says 72 hours in advance on a regular meeting, you have to post what's on the agenda so that anybody in the public can come and, and express their opinion on that item. That's the reason this exists. You could have very easily, unless this was just determined today, uh, you know, maybe that's what, where all of a sudden now all of this is coming up as an emergency. Again, it doesn't excuse it. But if somebody knew this yesterday, you could have called a special meeting at 545 and heard this item then. I think it's disgusting. I think it's shameful that it's being, it's being labeled an emergency under some guise that is supposedly the discussion before was, oh, this can, this, this can happen, and, and really not committing to when it was asked, where is it said that you can do this? And nobody would come up with an exact reading of the law or quoting something that says that you can do this. You have laws that you have to abide by, and adding an extra item because somebody made a mistake isn't the way. And it is disgusting, like I said, that these kids are being you. I mean, I don't know what you're going to do, but that they might not be able to go on their field trip because somebody made a mistake. But that doesn't mean that you get to circumvent what's out there and how you're supposed to conduct your meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Um, member Zhang, do you have a comment? Yeah, so the, the supermajority rule that we can have, have clarity about uh, the availability of that super majority rule to add an item, whatever as add, add on on that, or if I can see that, that would be good. Yeah. Member Grindel. Yeah, I just wanted to indicate it's, it's quite easy to get confused about the rules for calling a special meeting versus the uh, a body changing its agenda and adding an item by super majority. But um, I, I, I would appreciate it, um, Dr. Triplett, if staff um, or uh, staff could provide um, the citation that is uh, that's involved here. Certainly, um, but before we go there, I do want to point out it is 9:50. Do we want to make sure, sure that we um, don't go over? Um, I'd like to make a motion to extend the meeting to 10:15 or 10:30, just in case. I second it. Okay, motion made by myself, seconded by Member Zhang. Member Zhang, how do you vote? Yes. Member Marquez. Yes. Member Hill. Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also yes, five eyes to extend to 1030. Thank you. Um, Ms. Gutierrez, do you want to share um, the, the statute, so to speak? Yes. This is from our Brown Act manual, and um, I'm quoting, reading exactly as is. An urgency item may be considered when the board determines there is a need for an immediate action, and the need to act came to the agency's attention subsequent to the agenda being posted. This determination must be made by two-thirds vote of the board members present, or unanimous vote if less than two-thirds of the board is present. And this comes from Statute 5495.4.2, subsequent B2. Thank you, Ms. Gutierrez. If you don't mind, um, I can see where the confusion might be. The difference between emergency and urgency is uh, maybe where the difficulty is. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, I'd like to get a motion to approve item 1511, please. I move. I'll second. Motion made by Member Zhang, seconded by Member Grindel. How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? No, because I don't believe that's the correct reading. Member Grindel? Yes, because I think it is the correct reading. <laughs> I'm also a yes, four ayes and one no. Thank you so much. On to um, Board of Education committee reports, requests, and announcements. Um, Board of Education recognition announcements, Member Zhang. So just hope everyone uh, finished the school year strong. Thank you. Member Marquez. 
I just wanted to wish everyone a good luck with their finals and to all the staff for all the hard work they put in this school year and looking forward to a great graduation celebration. Member Hill. I would like to show appreciation for the U.S. Constitution and the California State Constitution um, and our way of life, which indicates that we are a country um, of laws, not of men. Uh, and what that really means is, is that we don't make arbitrary decisions based on personalities. We have rules and we follow the rules. And I think that what we've been seeing is that we've been playing fast and loose with a lot of rules, and uh, including the fact that we apparently do not have parliamentary procedure and people keep on invoking the governance handbook, but I don't think they've ever gone to read it. And by, and by the way, um, there's, a, there's also been a contention that um, somehow CSBA is in alignment with this. And I will tell you that I've gone to research what CSBA's position is, and it's no such thing. And not only that, I've also contacted and discussed with our former uh, CSBA board uh, uh, advisor uh, the fact that what we're doing is lawless. Um, and I will tell you that if you read our manual, if you read our governance handbook, we do not have parliamentary procedures. We do not identify motions. We do not identify points of order and all these different things. There's no such mention of that. We do not have sufficient procedures to actually conduct a meeting. And because of that, there is a clause in there that clearly states we need to follow and that the president needs to invoke and, and, um, and, and follow parliamentary procedure. And so again, we can decide to be lawless, but um, it's not a good path. Member Grindel? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll try to um, actually stick to the agendized discussion um, here um, instead of going off on other areas. So I, I just want to recognize the uh, and appreciate the district's recognition of Asian uh, and Pacific Islander um, Appreciation Month uh, and um, and also want to compliment all the teachers and students, you know, on the home stretch of this year and um, very excited about that. And one last time to um, to, compliment, to congratulate our new principal and head of uh, special education. Um, really, really thrilled to have such high quality people um, continuing to work for our district, generated in our district. Um, and they went through a rigorous, rigorous process. I feel sorry for them, actually, when you, once you <laughs> describe the, the process. I think I might have bailed out after phase two if I were involved. So I'm... Um, I'm not, I'm not encouraging you to relax it. I'm just I'm just saying I'm impressed. Um, so I wanted to compliment them, and they're going to be part of turning this district um, uh, to the positive and increasing enrollment and putting any financial problems behind us. So thank you. Thank you, Member Grindel. Um, with that said, I also um, echo your sentiments, Member Grindel, and the rest of the board, and also. Uh, I also wanted to make a point that it is National uh, Health Mental Health Awareness Month, also along with um, Asian Pacific Islander Heritage Month, and we do all need to take a deep breath sometimes. And um, there are a lot of chaos going around in our lives, and especially this year with with um, returning to school in person and the challenges that that all invoked for not only our students, but also our teachers as well and our staff. Um, and a lot of times we don't take time to really think about that and allow ourselves to digest while we're moving in this fast paced environment. So I just want to um, recognize all of the hard work that our, our teachers have done for our students and all of the hard work that our students have put in throughout the year, but not only that, but I know how much um, our executive team have persevered with um, shortages in staff and taking on multiple roles and also responsibilities. And I just really wanted to really, really appreciate you all up here. And thank you for all the hard work that you've done along with all of our teachers and the rest of our classified staff and all of our um, preschool teachers and our paraprofessionals. So thank you. Okay, um, on to Board of Education Committee reports. Um, are there any reporting out from Mission ROP, Mr. Um, Member Grindel? Nothing, to re nothing of substance to report. Um, 
Member Zhang, is there anything from SELPA? No. Member Marquez, is there anything from EBIC? None at this time. And is there anything from the Audit Committee? No. And there is nothing to report out from the Parcel Tax Committee, and also um, we don't have anything to com uh, communicate out for the Liaison Committee as well. So on to um, Board of Education requests. Member Zhang, do you have any requests at this time? No requests. Member Marquez? Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I, I'm not sure if everyone was aware, but I have been attending. I'm about to I have one more course to go, and then I'll Yay. be done with, yes, with the MIG. And in doing so, I've learned um, quite a bit, and I want to thank everyone for giving me the opportunity to attend, and also to my principal, who has allowed me to do so mm -hmm. while I'm supposed to be teaching. So many shouts out to my principal. Um, secondly, in reviewing some of the committees and some of the responsibilities that we have as a school district, what I c came to, to realize or to notice is that um, what our charters look like versus um, what it is that the expectation is of our public and the people that we serve. And currently, because I am serving on the audit committee, I would like to request that um, we have in the future new school year, that we put our actual charter for the audit committee um, on an agenda item, if not for a study session, so that we can review and see how we can improve our audit committee's charter, if we can lessen and be more pinpoint versus um, many pages or excessive and then find ourselves convoluted or lost. So at this time, that is my request. Thank you. I agree with that request. Okay. I also agree with that request. So we have a um, majority. Member Hill. Thank you. So I'm going to provide some handouts. Um, and then I'd like to um, explain and make, I think, I think you want to have a copy of this, um, Member Wen. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Triplett already has a copy of this. So board, on May 10th, I submitted a California Public Records Act request to Superintendent Triplett, Luis Gutierrez, and William Tunick, our outside legal counsel. I would like to provide some background on this topic and then request that the board instruct the district to expedite the production of the information I am asking for. On February 24th, 2022, I received an email addressed to my board email address from Mr. Tunick of Dennis Walliver Kelly there are legal counsel, and the email stated, Good morning, Member Hill. I'm assisting district staff with working through a backlog of public records requests and wanted to reach out regarding the following request for records under the California Public Records Act. And here's the, here's a, here's the cut and paste of the request. Hello, Ms. Gutierrez and Dr. Triplett. I would like to make a public records request for the following. Any and all records created, modified, updated, used, reviewed or opened by Member Hill on the laptop he used during the public board meetings of September 2nd, 2021, September 16th, 2021, and September 21st, 2021. Please include all records, such as any notes, messages, any communications from any applications used, emails, documents, Excel sheets, communications from social media accounts, and any program used specifically during the above dates and times, which is limited to public meetings being in session. Digital records are an acceptable format for this request. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you within the next few days. With gratitude, Mrs. M.A. Crossway. So my first reaction to this email was, why is the district retaining outside legal counsel at probably over $300 an hour to process a backlog of CPRA requests? For a public entity which should be following the California Public Records Act, the Brown Act, and Prop Proposition 59's mandates reinforcing the public's right of access to information concerning the conduct of the people's business, engaging a lawyer to review CPRA requests really should be done on an exception rather than a regular basis. But as I read through the abbreviated request, I haven't seen the original document, I could see this was no ordinary request. In our district, usually most CPRAs come from private citizens who live in our city. In this situation, however, I did a Google search for M.A. Crosswaite, and I found no such person living in Newark. As I expanded my search, there was a Crosswaite living in nearby Fremont, 
but I'm not sure if that was the person who submitted that request. And why would they have any interest in our school board proceedings and my laptop? As I re read the request more carefully, however, I could see that this was written by a lawyer. Interestingly, the dates requested were at approximately the same time when we, the board, were conducting an appointment process for the board seat left vacant after former member Elisa Martinez resigned in August of 2021. At that time, I came into possession of information that indicated that superintendent and Ms. Gutierrez, at a minimum, had been involved in rigging this appointment process and committing fraud by publishing false notices on our website and social media, indicating that the board had met and decided to reopen the application process after it had already been officially closed. As this was unfolding, I publicly called out this malfeasance in open session and requested that the board meet in closed session to launch an investigation into this matter, which the board refused to do. Is this new request for information from my laptop on those dates merely a coincidence or is it connected? And is it also merely a coincidence that the only people who could see that I was using a laptop were those up on the dais? Superintendent Triplett, Ms. Gutierrez, the cabinet, and the board. My laptop was not visible from the ground level audience section of the boardroom, nor on YouTube videos of the board proceedings. I checked. The question I have is, am I now being spied upon by those who should be falling under border oversight? I do not know the answer to this question, but the circumstances are highly suspicious and troubling. My response to the above request was as follows. William, thank you for the email. The only information I access on my laptop during board meetings is to see the electronic version of board docs, including the board agenda and associated attachments. I do not have other records as I purposely do not check email, text messages, social media, or other electronic applications as I consider it rude, and I strive to give my full attention to board proceedings. As a consequence of this unusual exchange, however, I became interested in knowing who specifically was requesting the purported contents of my laptop on those dates. Thus, on April 27th, I sent an email to Mr. Tunick asking him to forward me the entire CPRA request from Mrs. Crossway, as well as the contact information for that requester. Mr. Tunick replied back that, quote, in general, the district does not disclose the email address or other contact information of requesters. If the board seeks this information through the board president, the district could provide it at that time, end quote. For those of you that are not familiar, this is mealy mouth lawyer talk for, I don't want to give you this information, so I'm going to make up a phony process to obstruct your access. I have since responded with a formal CPRA of my own requesting this documentation, and a response is, by law, due back from the district tomorrow, Friday, May 20th. Board, the public has a right to know whether, whether the people they elected to represent them are now being spied upon by those that they have been elected to oversee. We need to know whether we have corruption in our district, and if so, to what extent. The best way to get to the bottom of this is through full transparency. Consequently, I'm requesting that the board instruct the district to expeditiously respond to my CPRA request so that we may answer that question. Thank you. So after seeing the public record, I think it is very problematic that I see somebody wants to access information on a personal laptop because I thought like board members like whatever we do on a laptop shouldn't be subject to public disclosure. So it is, it is somewhat a very, very unusual request to see Member Hill's laptop, particularly on that one particular, oh, I guess it's three meetings, not, not, just, not just one meeting. And uh, yeah, so, so, so this is very, very unusual. So I, I, I do think Member Hill might be targeted for some whatever the, the request was for Mr. Hill to whether or not we wanted to extradite the, his Public Records Act request. We didn't, we didn't agen agendize a discussion of this okay. item. So well, I don't think there's an agenda. I mean, I think he can discuss it. He, oh, I he made his point. You can discuss your request. He, absolutely. He can comment well, well, on the, it. Well, the there's request is just to, is to see who is actually requesting this. Or yeah. who I, this Ma Crossway really is. Right. Yeah, I want to know who that is because, by the way, and I will show you right here. This, everybody, is my laptop. 
you can see it is very small if i open it up like this nobody can see the only people that can see it are the people up here the my understanding is that the uh... there is no process for um, jumping the line when it comes to public records request but i'm confident that staff would would respond to member hills public records request in uh... in the proper course am, am i correct in that mister triplet yes Dr. yes Dr. That's, Dr. that's correct we um, so the question i want to ask is do, do we have do are we legally allowed to disclose the requesters information yes so um, per guidance from legal um, we um, we we do disclose the name of the person um, however um, we don't disclose the um, the contact information I see. That's, that's not what, that's, that's what, not what um, mr. tunic's response to me stated he said that I can ask the board through the president um, so num number one the CPRA is a completely independent process so as I've said before no secret can be kept from the board we can see any and all information my CPRA request is an independent action as a private citizen but we as the board have the authority to tell the district to disclose that and they can disclose it either in open session or in closed session so, so given the proper process, I do. I, I, given the unusual nature of this request, I will say, just do it in time, following the regular procedure. Uh, that the law is seven days or fourteen days. We'll ten days, and it's expires tomorrow. The ten days is up. They have to make a determination. So, I believe the the request on the table is. Um, Reply to the CPRA tomorrow. To reply to the CPRA yeah. tomorrow. Is, is that, I thought the request was for the to board expedite. to uh, direct us to the Dr. So Triplett, so if, my, my if request, it's expedition, it's going to get done tomorrow. My request okay. is to produce this information. So I've requested this information. My request is to produce it. So, and I'm, I'm requesting that the board, given the, the um, seriousness of this issue, um, also take an independent action requiring that this information be produced. And that is separate from my CPRA. So, so that's just, my request. So just to be clear, because um, uh, I just want to make sure the other board members are, are clear on, um, on the, the, the request. Um, so we, we intend to respond to the CPRA request. But what I hear, Member Hill, you saying is that you are asking the board to approve um, beyond what we normally do to, with CPRA requests to actually provide the contact information of this individual. So if the board agrees to that, then they are saying that they are directing, um, they are directing us to provide the contact information. We, we did provide the name of the person like we do in any CPRA request. But uh, the, so that's, the name that's of what's this on the person table, appears to be a pseudonym. Um, and so we need to get to the bottom of who this person actually is. I have no. All I know is that that's the name of the person. Well, it'll no be idea. very clear if we see who the contact um, information is for. Um, so that that will that will provide whether this person truly exists or not, and how to get a hold of them. So it uh, it sounds like the the request is on the table. Does the board want to direct the district to provide not just what normally is provided in the CPRA request, but um, above and beyond that? No. I'm not okay with that, and I hope that my other fellow board members agree that, you know, um, we should definitely follow our current procedures on how we reply to CPRA requests and, um, and provide the information that is laid out by our legal team. And, um, and if there's a reason for us not um, to be able to disclose contact information for any reason, um, especially if the intent of releasing the information and that person is harassed for their public legal right to request a CPRA request, um, I don't think that's okay. Thank so I, I think it's unfair to make an assumption that harassment would occur. Uh, you're um, making I'm assumptions about um, all of us here. Um, so, yeah. 
So, well then, like I said, the best, the, 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 the best disinfectant um, is sunlight um, and transparency. But if you're not interested in providing transparency on this project process, we'll have to go through the formal legal process of the CPRA. So, point of order. So point of order. There is no point of order. Is, um, the, um, is there a second or is there a majority of people who want to? Um, I agree with Member Nguyen. Thank you. Sorry, President Nguyen. Thank you. I do have a request, though. I hope I can get to it. Yes, I will let you get to it. I won't skip over you. Uh, make sure, Mr. Mr. Hill, are you done with your request? So I don't have any other seconds. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Member Grindel. Yes, I have a, a fairly long uh, request as well, unfortunately. And um, the um, I don't think as long as that one, though. Um, it, it, it does sadden me to have to make this request. As will be clear to anyone who's been watching our meetings, Member Hill and I have strong disagreements about the proper role of a school board member. I believe it's our role to provide pol policy direction, hire and evaluate the superintendent, approve and monitor the budget. It appears that Member Hill believes that our role is to micromanage this district and even to get directly involved in personnel issues. His approach is incorrect and is dangerous to the district. As much as it saddens me, I'm, I feel an obligation to stand against damaging statements made by Member Hill. In the meeting of May 5th, 2022, um, there was an extreme example of this behavior. For clarity, I'll describe a particularly egregious situation. Mr. Froster, a Newark Memorial High School teacher, well, a Newark teacher right now, spoke at a public comment claiming that he had been reassigned due to his expression of opinions regarding Apex credit recovery. Among other issues, Mr. Foster has claimed that there was, there was rampant cheating by students and that the cheating was enabled and, by counselors and teachers. Mr. Foster reported that he, that he was told that his, that his opinions and the way he stated them made numerous other teachers feel uncomfortable and created a w hostile work environment for them. Mr. Foster stated that he believed that, that his reassignment to the junior high school was in retaliation for his complaints about Apex and his colleagues. Mr. Foster has every right to complain about alleged retaliation, even if a board meeting is a less than ideal venue. Claims of retaliation for expressing opinions is a serious charge, and I take it very seriously. However, a complaint is not necessarily true. It must be investigated impartially. Um, there are always two sides to such stories, and district staff and consultants are, are experts on how to handle them. At the meeting on May 5th, May, Me Member Hill then read a two-page written statement. In his statement, Member Hill made ac ac accusations that there was a massive staff-enabled cheating going on with Apex credit recovery by students, teachers, and counselors. Member Hill also described his conclusion with certainty that the complaint of retaliation was true and accused staff of covering up the alleged cheating and even going to the extent of listing phone numbers and website addresses of agencies that could, re that could receive um, complaints about um, retaliation. No evidence for these serious charges was or has been provided. Mr. Hill has, has an obligation to be impartial and not to project unfounded criticism from the dais. He betrayed his obligation and in so doing cast a cloud over the students and staff of Newark Memorial High School and this entire board. Jumping to this unfounded conclusion with no evidence or investigation was unfair to all the students and teachers and other staff who were involved. By these actions, Member Hill may in fact be contributing to a hostile work environment at the high school. This situation makes it clear that the proper role for, for the member of the board is to consider all information, including a report from the superintendent, and to study and to studiously avoid commenting on personnel issues. Member Hill has been reminded of this numerous times, yet he continues this ir irresponsible behavior which harms the district. A board member repeating damaging statements attacking the reputation of our students, teachers, and counselors without investigation of fact is despicable. I will speak up to defend our students and educators from such unfounded slander. I unequivocally reject these accusations and support um, and, and I support the students and staff's right for a presumption of innocence in the face of unsubstantiated accusations. Therefore, I want to request that staff direct our legal advisors to, advisors to review Member Hill's actions on this and other cases and to prepare a report that describes any legal exposure that may have been created by Member Hill 
and what board actions could be taken to formally reject his statements, defend our students and staff, and to protect the district from liability. I hope that a majority of this board will support this request. So I would like to comment, um, since this request is directed at me, so it's important when people speak to put on your listening ears. Um, and, I, and I have my statement in, in front of me right here that I read. And I said numerous times that these were allegations. Um, I never said that they were a statement of fact. I said they were allegations. And I said that these allegations have been made for the past year and there has been no investigation. And I was calling for an investigation. I was not calling for a pronouncement or a verdict. I was saying, we need to have an investigation. And I'm happy to provide, you can go back and watch it. I'm happy to provide a copy of this. I said allegations. Um, but furthermore, Mem Member Grindal, I would like you to understand that earlier, so you, you, you dismissed my recognition of the US Constitution and the state constitution. But I would like to encourage you to go back and read more in that area. Because as an, as an elected official, we have something that's known as absolute privilege. Um, and if you're not familiar with absolute privilege, the founders believed that it was so important to have free speech among elected officials that they provide virtually unlimited protection for anything that elected officials say. And it is so that we, ma'am, and so, so there's We're in the order, we have a request on the table, and so, uh, this is not a discussion. This is a request session. Okay. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so repeating my request, I, 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 I hope there's a majority of the board that would, would uh, direct us, direct staff to investigate um, the actions of Mr. Mr. Um, Hill and to report to us. So, so the request is to investigate whether what he said in the last meeting when I wasn't here will pose any legal risk to the district? Um, that action and, and any others, whether or not um, it's, it, it creates legal, legal risk to the, to the district, yes. Okay. Do we have support? Well, I, I want to I first get from the superintendent. Do, do you really think there's legal risks or...? or I mean, if, if, uh, if you think the legal risk is minimal or non-existent, so probably we don't. If you do think there's a, there, there, there is a validity about the claim that we might, uh, what, what, what's being said two weeks so ago. So point of order. Point of order. So point of, point of order. So Dr. Triplett is not a lawyer. <laughs> I'd be happy to respond to your question, Member Jean. Um, so I believe uh, Mr. Member Grindel's uh, request was to have a legal counsel review it. Um, I, I agree with Member Hill that I am not a lawyer and so I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, um, deem to, to pass judgment in that way, but I believe the request was, was for, request. for legal. That was my request. That was my request. Go ahead, Member. Member well, if it's only for legal, I hope this can be minimal. I mean, rather than being a public agenda item. Given, given so like that, I'm Dr. happy to make it public because it needs to be public. So, you know, here on the one hand, the board is refusing to actually show transparency around, you know, what seems to be, an, you know, a, a spying on my laptop, and yet you're, all, you're, you're, you're very willing to actually go in and, and challenge me on my political positions on things which I was elected to actually provide and try to claim that they're illegal. And all I'm going to say is, is that you're going to waste a whole bunch of money um, in doing that. Um, a whole bunch of, because I've just told you what the law is. Absolute privilege. We elected officials have absolute privilege in speaking. Okay. Member Marquez. Yes, thank you, Madam President. So as I sit here and I listen to my fellow board members, my concern is this. I do not find it our place to sit here and quote law. That is not our responsibility. Um, one thing is for us to attend and to participate fully when it comes to the, the correct and proper training so that we understand what our roles are fully correct. here, here on, the, on the board. Um, when it comes to um, my fellow board member Hill's request, I look and I think, okay, the legal steps, what are the steps? Are we taking the steps that we're supposed to? Are we following the CPR, CPRA? When it comes to transparency and what he mentioned as well, okay, 
if I was to vote and say, well, yes, I'm in favor, I think that we need to stop and, yes, deal with his, then I would have a public member or someone from the community come in and say, well, why is his situation being handled or put to the forefront and I've been waiting and I haven't been um, responded to or, or had a resolution with what my request is when it comes to CPRA. Then in listening to also to my fellow board member, um, former president, is the fact that when it comes to just listening to legal, I am not the attorney, neither, neither are any of us here. So if we have legal counsel and those in place who will guide us and say, this is what you can and cannot do, this is what we recommend that you do and cannot do, this is what's favorable to you, and, and to make sure that we are not damaging our youth nor our academic community from pre-K all the way through the high school, then yes, we do need to make sure that we have our legal counsel tell us what we can and cannot do. We are not the law. Correct. I actually want to add, add on, on the previous request from Member Hill. I was a Member Hill, if I were you in that position, I will probably work with the police first. Because like, like you said. Okay, I mean, point I'm of sorry, order. We're, 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 on, we're on uh, Member Grindel's request. Yes, point of order. Okay, are there, is there a majority uh, to uh, um, support Member Hill's request? Member Grindel. I mean, sorry, Member Grindel's. Thank you, Member Grindel. For legal purposes and clarity, yes. Okay, um, I'm also in agreement with Member Marquez, so we do have a majority, thank you. But when I said minimal, I said I hope this is not like a character campaign attack. It's just um, from a strict legal point. Sure looks like it. Okay, so I do have one request, and that request is for all of our the board members who haven't completed um, Masters in Governance to be able to do so. So if I can, uh, I hope that you, my fellow board members, um, Agree with me in that. A point of clarification. Yes. Um, you want do you um, do you want to pursue in your request making it a, a mandatory for board members or um, just to make it an encouragement? No, a mandatory. I support that, even though I have some. That means I have some work to do. Yes. Thank. I. Yes, I need another. I agree. Okay, thank you. Okay, with that, um, Superintendent, concluding comments. Okay, thank you, um, President Wen. So, um, I just wanted to, uh, to end with some appreciations. One, um, the, we did have an event for our uh, retirees and um, for staff members who um, um, have been in the district for so uh, the length of time that uh, we, we awarded them longevity um, longevity awards. Um, it was a really beautiful event. Um, uh, when I think of the uh, lifetime of service that these people have dedicated, um, I, I, I wish we could have done more, to be honest. Yes. Um, to dedicate one's life to our kids, our district, our community, um, but I was really, really pleased and, um, and appreciative of uh, the HR department for um, creating that event. And I also really wanted to thank the, uh, the board members, Member Grindel, Member Marquez, Member Jun, Member Wen, who attended the event and, um, and supported it. That was, it was really lovely. Um, I also want to appreciate Member uh, uh, President Wen for her badminton skills. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, those of you who don't know, uh, President Wen um, went and uh, taught some of our junior high uh, badminton, and I wasn't aware of how good she was. But um, comes to t come to find out that she, you know, she probably should have gone pro at some point. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for um, for. I, I think it's uh, all joking aside. I think it's really indicative of your dedication to our kids and our community. I remember when you put in so much time above and beyond what we do here, which in and of itself is such a tremendous amount of time. You brought uh, cookies to every, um, every school the other day for appreciation of teachers and staff, um, as well as helped us to deliver um, food to, to all, the, um, all the schools. So I just really want to thank you. And then uh, lastly, I wanted to uh, appreciate Member Marquez 
um, for uh, the amount of time you put into the Masters of Governance, it is a, it is a huge, huge undertaking to, to be trained in all of that. And uh, you, you've been determined to do that and really inform yourself and educate yourself. And um, I myself have gone through some of them, but not all. So I think you, you have me beat at this point, and I need to, I need to continue and, and to go to some of those trainings as well. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, um, Superintendent Triplett. With that, uh, may I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Motion made by Member Grindel. May I get a second? Second. Seconded by Member Zhang. Meeting adjourned at 10. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> How do you vote, Member Zhang? Yes. <laughs> Member Marquez? Yes. Member Hill? Yes. Member Grindel? Yes. I'm also, yes, unanimous, five eyes. Thank you. Um, meeting adjourned at 1028. Thank you.